Welcome everyone to the Simply SaaS Forum. My name is John Birdsong and I'm with the Atlanta Ventures team. Welcome today to the Atlanta Tech Village. Give yourself a round of applause. So at Atlanta Ventures, we serve entrepreneurs through content, community, and capital. Uh, content and community, you're seeing right here. There's going to be amazing speakers today uh, coming in from Alabama to Raleigh, Durham, and uh, locally. And uh, they all have wonderful experiences that they're going to share. And we can't wait to hear their presentations. The first one today is Brad McGinnity, and he hails from Raleigh, Durham. Brad is the CRO of 15.5 and is a double Tar Heel. So, you know, there's a lot of dookies in the room, too. So, um, Brad's CRO of 15.5. He has helped take them from an inbound an expansion to outbound with the help of a great team. And prior to 15.5, he was the co-founder of Windsor Circle, which is predictive analytics in marketing software. And then before then, he was one of the top sales reps at Bronto. And we all know Bronto uh, is uh, one of the most successful stories from the Raleigh-Durham area that just got acquired by NetSuite. And He's got three daughters. We uh, we have we have that in common. I only have one, but he's got three, so it's a lot of weddings. But let's give Brad a round of applause. He's going to be talking on the topics of sales today, and this is a great presentation. So, Brad, come on up. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Uh, you mic'd up. You good? All right, that is on and live. Three daughters. You guys are going to get to see one of them here in a moment. She's a sales rep who thinks she has a qualified deal. It'll make sense in a moment. Uh, excited to be with you all. Um, this is a great event, great venue. We've got a couple of uh, spaces like this in the Raleigh-Durham area with HQ Raleigh and uh, the American Underground. And so um, Windsor Circle was actually born out of the American Underground and kind of graduated out of there into our own space. So super excited to be in a place like the Atlanta Tech Village and uh, be a small contributor into the great work that you guys are doing here. <clears throat> All right, I'm not going to get into a sales pitch of 15.5, despite the fact that it looks like it. OK, so this is my four-year-old daughter. She turns four next month. And she's at Rookie Sports at the YMCA. This is also your sales reps and all of their deals and their sales managers right now. Oh, that didn't work the way it was supposed to. Does that look familiar to anybody? My favorite is that my daughter is running down there getting whipped by the noodles, and she doesn't even have a soccer ball. <laughs> like, she, she, she's totally lost the ball. So, I think the ball is in the deal, the kids are the sales reps. It's not even a qualified deal, but she's still chasing it like there's a real deal there. But there's no deal. She just doesn't know it because she's four and she's cute. <clears throat> so we are going to try to create today a little bit of structure and a little bit of systemization to uh, your sales pipeline and your forecasting and how you think about selling. So I did a little bit of analysis before coming in here and some skimming of LinkedIn profiles and things like this. Um, I have a sense that most of you are executives or founders in tech companies, less than 20 people. So uh, by show of hands, who does that fit? Less than 20 people, executive or founder? Okay. And, uh, and how many of you are doing some founder-led selling or maybe you've got a couple sales reps under you and you're kind of acting as a sales manager, but really you don't know a whole lot about selling? <laughs> okay. So a few hands there. All right. So today we are going to talk. Okay, we're going to talk about two main things. So the first is opportunity stages. The most important part of our opportunity stages conversation is going to come around to this idea of verifiable outcomes. Everybody's got stages, and your reps are moving deals through stages, but in a way that is oftentimes very inconsistent. Everybody's thinking about these stages and the terminology in different ways, and so 
You could have uh, two deals that are actually in the same stage in reality, but they're marked as different stages inside of Salesforce. And then we're going to talk about this concept called MedPick. <clears throat> it's an acronym that puts some framework around something that your best reps are intuitively doing, and they might not know that they're doing it. And so it ensures really high deal health and this uh, ability to score our pipeline as well. So first we'll talk opportunity stages. <clears throat> so pretty standard SaaS sales opportunity stages. We qualify people, we do a discovery process to interview them, we show them a demo of our software. Um, we're gonna go into some kind of solution fit, proposal stage, then we're gonna negotiate, we have a verbal agreement, and then we have a one deal. At 15.5 we have uh, a little bit of a wrinkle on that for the engagement stage and the resolving objection stage. We'll talk about those in a moment, they'll make more sense. So first, qualification. All we're simply trying to do here is figure out, is this deal worth my time? I've got this inbound lead or I've got this outbound customer that I'm talking to and I need to figure out if they are actually qualified. The most common methodology for this is BANT, budget, authority, need, and time frame. Oh, sorry, one quick thing. I did really ugly slides with a lot of text on them. You guys are gonna get a copy of these. We're gonna move a little bit fast here, so don't put a lot of stress on yourself to write down all the words because you'll get a copy that you can hopefully follow as a bit of an instruction manual. So I like ugly slides that are tactical as opposed to really pretty slides that you can't do anything with. <clears throat> all right, so um, at 15.5, we use shite. Seats, high growth in 90 days, technical fit, and there's some kind of executive sponsor. If it ain't shite, it ain't shit at 15.5. <clears throat> okay, so we have verifiable outcomes. This is really important. You need to be able to document that somebody has actually met your criteria, whether it's Bant or Puma or Shite or anything else. And you should be able to have a third party who's looking at that. If you have an SDR in place as well and there are qualifying leads for an account executive, the account executive should be corroborating this. So then we move into discovery. <clears throat> in discovery, you are doing an interview with your customer to identify how you can help them. What is your value proposition for this specific customer? There's a lot of great techniques and frameworks for how you do the interview. Spin selling is an incredibly popular one. Um, I like a variation from Dale Carnegie. As is, should be, pain, barriers, payout. What are you doing today? What do you want to be doing? What's the problem with what you're doing today? What's prevented you from doing something different? If you were to fix this, what's the good thing that happens for you? What's the payoff from doing this? The verifiable outcome, you can't move from discovery into the demo stage in your forecast, in your pipeline, until you have a confirmed demo on the calendar. Calendar request is sent, your prospect has hit accept, now you can move it into the demo stage. <clears throat> in the demo stage, we're gonna show our vision for how we're gonna help solve this customer's problem. Here's what we all do during demos, is we show our product. Well, it's really only one of the four things that you should be doing. When you are going through this demo stage, you need to be showing them your product, but you also need to be reinforcing the pain showing them your product, showing them the payoff from solving this problem or using your solution. And then this is a really critical one that we so often miss. They need to see a path to making this thing become reality. So what happens is they understand the problem, they have some vision for how you're gonna get them to utopia, but they don't understand this part in the middle. And when we don't understand this part in the middle, we just walk away because it's easier to do nothing as buyers than it is to move forward with something when we have this big unknown in between. So get them talking to your customer success managers if you have that function. Under, help them to understand what training is going to look like. Is there an implementation plan? What does support look like? So that they can have a, a more clear vision of their journey as you and your business takes them from here with problem to here with solution. So we oftentimes skip this path stage and it's really important to do that in this demo stage. Your verifiable outcome, you can't move from demo into the next stage until you've done X. Okay, now here's where it gets a little bit interesting because we have this engagement stage and this idea of resolving objections. So if we have another scheduled call, we're most likely moving into the engagement stage. In the engagement stage, we are still proactively selling. We're gonna talk about this stage in, in more detail in a quick moment here. <clears throat> so we can either move into the engagement stage if we've moved into this place where we're now resolving objections, they can list out their concerns and we can start to address these concerns, we would skip the engagement stage and move directly into the stage that we call resolving objections. So important that you've got a scheduled call accepted by the customer before you can move it out of the demo stage. Okay, the engagement stage. It's a big part of our sales. 
it also sucks. We hate the engagement stage, it's just reality. The reason it's reality is that it's pretty easy to get somebody into a demo. They've got some curiosity around what you do, they have some problems and they think you might be able to solve it and they wanna see if they can really do it. So it's really easy to get them into a demo. So the, the first few stages here of like, hey, let me do some qualification, let's do some interviewing, let me show you our product. That part's really easy. Now it's really hard to get your customer from here into the place where they've said, I'm actually gonna pay you money to solve this problem over here with a closed one opportunity. So after our demo, oftentimes the customer says, hey, this is really interesting, I'd like to learn more, um, but let us go back as a team and we'll just debrief and we'll get back in touch with you. So debrief and get back in touch with you means I don't know enough yet to really be able to move forward with anything concrete. And so as a sales rep, I am still selling. I'm just not selling by showing them another demo. I'm selling by writing up a proposal, giving them a chance to talk to a customer success manager, going through an ROI calculator. So one takeaway here is just sit down with your team and just document a bunch of post-demo strategies. What are things that we can do to keep our prospect engaged so that they don't go dark on us? Because everybody disappears here in this stage. Now the entire point of the engagement stage, and really the entire point of the sales process, is to get to what I call the list. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna talk about the list here in a second. What's that? Okay, <clears throat> so if we haven't heard from our customer in two weeks, kill the deal. You can always revive the deal. It's easy to go into Salesforce and go from closed lost back into engagement or closed lost into resolving objections. But don't leave a deal in your pipeline when you haven't heard from this person in two weeks. And we have reps that are doing this all the time. This is, might be my daughter. She's still running down the field. She thinks she's got a deal. She's calling this person. She's sending emails. She's doing all this stuff. And there's no soccer ball anymore, right? So kill the deal. Your whole goal here is to identify what their objections are. So we have this idea of resolving objections and what I call the list. Okay, so the only reason that people haven't bought your stuff yet is because they have concerns. That's okay, everybody has concerns. If you can resolve all of their concerns, the logical conclusion is that they should purchase. If you can't resolve all of their concerns, they're not gonna purchase. So a sales process is a systematic removal of objections. When you're doing a demo, all you're doing is proactively resolving a bunch of objections that they probably have. Is this thing easy to use? Is it gonna solve the problem that I have? Can I do it on a mobile app, right? You talk about all those things in a demo, and you don't think of this as like, I'm resolving objections. But really, that's what you're doing. These people have a lot of concerns, and you're just resolving them. In the resolving objections stage, <clears throat> we're gonna do a Q&A in a minute. <clears throat> in the resolving objections stage, we now have a list from our customer. What are your biggest concerns about 15.5? That if resolved, you'd feel comfortable moving forward with 15.5. And now this is a checklist that you and your customer can work collaboratively to solve. You will not be able to resolve all the objections and all their concerns. Some of them are not inside of your control. But the goal here is that you're working collaboratively with your customer to resolve these issues with the commitment that if these things were resolved, they would feel comfortable signing up. So in resolving objections, we're working through this list together with our customer, and we're trying to resolve all of them except for one, which is price. And I throw legal and payment terms in there, but usually it's price. So when we've resolved everything except for price, and they've committed to some time frame for making a final decision, we can now move out of resolving objections and into negotiation. The reason I separate out price is because you have control now. In resolving objections, you don't have control over all of the concerns and all of the issues. Some of them might be some project that you can't change. It's just inside of their business. When it's about price, you might not want to agree to their price, but you can. You might not want to agree to their legal terms, but you can. You might not want to agree to their payment terms, but you can. So at the end of the month, at the end of the, deal, or the, end of the quarter, at the end of the year, if you want to, you can get that deal signed by giving them the things that they're asking for, which is why we separate it about this one from resolving objections. So one of the big things for my reps is that they'll have deals that are in, in the negotiation stage but there's more concerns than just price. And so we're going back and we're saying, okay, well, what are all their concerns? Oh, it's not just price. Well, you need to move it back into resolving objections. Let's resolve those other issues, and then we can come back to the price conversation. 
Once we have done this, we have a verbal. Um, verbal, we're going to send over an order form, try to get it signed as quickly as possible. And then that'll move us into the closed one stage. Really quick note here on the closed one stage, your account executive thinks their job is done. I've got a signed order form, boss. Like, what else could you want from me? Well, I want data. So I really need some good data entry here so that I can understand how we won this deal and better understand our customers. And then I need a really clean handoff over to customer success or support or implementations or whatever that group is. The sales rep's job isn't done until they've made a really good handoff so that this customer is actually going to be successful. Their job is not to get a closed one deal. Their job is to assign a happy, successful customer. All right, so these are your opportunity stages. The verifiable outcome is really important so that all of your reps aren't moving their deal forward until they have achieved that very specific thing that has to get done, which is listed there for each stage. All right, so now we move to MedPick. Anybody ever heard of Medic or MedPick before? Couple heads, not really, okay. It's actually a reasonably new idea for me as well. Um, I've been doing this thing at Windsor Circle called Bulletproofing, and then I learned about MedPick, and it's a nice variation on it, and the world needs another acronym, so we're gonna use it today. All right, metrics, economic buyer, decision process, decision criteria, paperwork, identified pain, champion, and competition. Remember, these are gonna get emailed to you. <clears throat> You're gonna take these and put them into your Salesforce opportunities as custom fields. You're then gonna have a spot next to each one of them where you can put in a number, a zero, a one, or a two, and then you'll use a formula field in Salesforce to just do the math and just add up the sum of those fields so you can get an idea of deal and opportunity health. <clears throat> All right, so now let's go and talk about each one of these things. You're going through and you're identifying each of these parts of MedPick just as you're doing discovery, as you're doing your demo, as you're in this engagement stage, as you're doing resolving objections, right? It's just part of the dialogue that you need to be having. And part of what MedPick gives you is a way to have this checklist of things that your best reps are intuitively doing anyway, but you don't want to have a gap and forget something. So MedPick helps you to not forget something. All right, so metrics. Um, here, we're looking to quantify the payoff of our solution. So the first thing is that we have to identify a KPI. Is it about increasing revenue, saving time, improving customer or employee morale, lowering attrition, increasing conversion rates? What are the KPIs? Then we need a number associated with each of them. So in our scoring model, your deal is a zero on this attribute when we don't even know what the KPIs are that are important to our customer. It's a one when we've defined the KPI but we don't know the number. And then it's a two when we've defined the KPI and we know the numbers that are gonna go into it. So we're gonna have a couple of these slides that I'll show you from Windsor Circle in a couple spots. This is one of them here with our productivity one. So 72% of our customers say that 15.5 has made them more productive. They say it has made them 45% more productive for those who said yes, and overall 32% more productive, right? So the KPI here is productivity. The quantifiable part of it is this 32% more productive, right? And then we talk to the customer about that, and we can quantify it with the customer to move us from a zero into a two. Okay, so that's metrics. Economic buyer. <clears throat> you need to know who controls the money. We are oftentimes selling solutions that are unbudgeted, right? Our people didn't come into the year expecting to buy our software or our product. And so we need somebody who can move money around. This is the economic buyer. So we're a zero when we don't even know who this person is. We're a one when we know them, but we've never talked to them. And we're a two when we have a relationship. Next is our decision criteria. So what are the technical and the non-technical requirements? We're a zero when we don't know the requirements. We're a one, we know the requirements, but we haven't met them all. And we're a two when the customer has confirmed that we have met them all. This is one of those things where our opinion doesn't really matter. It's only their opinion that matters as to whether or not we've met their technical requirements. All right, we're gonna do a quick tangent on decision criteria. There's a book called The Challenger Customer, which is the sequel to The Challenger Sale, which many of you have probably heard of. And it talks about a lot of great things. So one of the things that comes up is this idea of how hard is it to make decisions as a group, because it's usually groups of people that are buying software. There's 5.4 people involved in every decision. They have to agree on three things as a group of people. What is the problem? They have to agree on what is the solution, and then they have to agree on the supplier to fulfill this solution. The hardest of the three for them to do as a group of 5.4 people is identifying the solution. 
So this is important as it relates to decision criteria because you're going to ask your customer, do you have decision criteria? And they're going to tell you what the decision criteria is. But there is a good chance that that person's colleagues and the other stakeholders involved in the deal don't agree. So has your buyer as a group actually reached consensus on the solution identification? And oftentimes we as salespeople need to coach our buyer on how to go into their organization and create consensus on what the solution actually is. Otherwise, we're going to have false decision criteria. All right, back to MedPick. Decision process. <clears throat> who are the people who are involved? How and when are they going to make decisions? So we are at a zero when we don't know who these stakeholders are. We're at a one when we understand the process and the stakeholders, which is about understanding. And we're at a two when we know that we can meet the requirements and we've met the stakeholders. We're getting closer to the end, we're in the second half. The paper process. If you are selling an SMB product, you probably don't need to worry about this one. You can just drop down to Medic and drop the P. If you're doing mid-market and enterprise, you need to know procurement processes with purchase orders and MSAs and legal and security requirements. So we're at a zero when we don't know what needs to get done. We're at a one when we know what needs to be done. And we're at a two when we not only know what needs to be done, but we have enough information that we can accurately predict when those things are going to be completed. Identified pain. This is the one that's a little bit tricky because you think the P is going to be the pain and it's actually the paperwork and the I is like, what's the I stand for? Identified. If you don't have pain, you don't have a deal, right? If there's no gap between what somebody's doing today and what they want to be doing, you do not have an opportunity. So you first need to make sure that there is actually pain. Then we need to quantify this pain. So we're at a zero when we don't know what the pain is. We're at a one when we know what the pain is, but we haven't yet quantified it. Like, I've got high employee attrition. That's cool, I know the pain, but I haven't yet quantified it. What is that costing your business? So then we're at a two, and we've uncovered it, and we've quantified it, and this is really important. And the customer has agreed that the status quo cannot be maintained. It doesn't mean that they're gonna go with you. It just means that they have a committed, they're gonna do something about this problem. At 15.5, here are some of the pain points that we solve for our customers. So we're getting them to agree. Oh, I've got disconnected employees. I've got an annual review process that doesn't work. We've got some metrics behind it. We're able to quantify this for the customer, get them to agree to the numbers, and now we can mark this thing off as a two. All right, our champion. You guys think you have champions and you don't have champions. Champions are people with power and they have something to gain from the deal. You have a lot of coaches. You have a lot of fans. They don't have power or they don't have something to win, something to gain from this thing. So you need to have both of those things in order to have a real champion. And the champion is somebody who's going to get this thing in front of your stakeholders. So we're at a zero when we don't have a champion. We're at a one when we think we have a champion, but we haven't tested it yet. And we're at a two when we've actually tested it, they've confirmed and agreed to be a champion, take this thing to the economic fire. And lastly is competition. <coughs> so uh, you need to know who the competitors are. You need to know the strengths and weaknesses relative to the competitors and you need to be able to position your product against those competitors. So we're at a zero, we don't know who they are. We're at a one, and we think we know who they are. And we're at a two, oops, we're at a two, and we've actually been told who they are. All right, so here's some summary stuff for you. Um, and the opportunity side, this is again important because it creates some common vocabulary across your sales team. It means that when a deal is forecasted into a certain stage, that actually has real meaning because people are using the stages in a consistent way. And we've got this idea of verifiable outcomes, which is so critical to having good forecasting and a clean pipeline. And then on the med pick side, a lot of this is just making sure you don't forget something. Like, how many times did you get to the end of the line and figure out you forgot to talk about the paperwork process? Or you forgot to quantify the pain. You talked about the pain, but you didn't quantify the pain. And then you think you've got a lot of deals in your pipeline, but fundamentally, they're not healthy deals. So whereas the opportunity stages let you know kind of where you are, the med pick helps you understand how healthy things are in that process. All right, I think we're out of time for questions, but we were going to do them. Or maybe we do have time for questions. Do we do? Ah, OK, we do have time for questions. Sorry, go ahead right here, first one. I, I think you said, kill the deal, you can come back later. W what does that look like for the salesperson who's making the decision, and how does it show up in the database, and what's the communication with the customer, or the other prospect? Yeah. So part of it is that when you've got an opportunity in the engagement stage, for me that means you've got a 40% chance of winning this deal. If you haven't heard from the customer in two weeks, you do not have a 40% chance of winning that deal. 
So the sales rep needs to go market as closed lost. They can still try to sell. They can still talk to this customer. They can still do outreach to the customer. But I don't want it in my sales forecast as a sales leader. So I want this thing gone and marked as closed lost. Now, if they get some engagement, the person's like, sorry, I went on vacation for a week. I'm back. We're super interested. Great. Move it back into the engagement stage. So that's the database part of it. And there does need to be some communication in some ways to the manager that says, hey, I've killed this thing in, in, a, a guidan in following our, our guidance and our rules here around how we handle stages, but I'm still working it, which is fine. I just don't want it in my forecast if it's not a real deal. Okay, you go next, because you gave me great eye contact and oh, lots of head you. nodding. You're a hey, winner. Thanks again. Um, in your opinion, I love, by the way, thank you, I love all the verifiable outcomes. In your opinion and your experience, do you think that the best salespeople are they fudging positively on the sort of zero, one, two, or are they sort of more pessimistic and say, I really don't know what it is, or the, are they accurate? Yeah, the, the better salespeople, I would say, are skeptical but accurate. It's, it is, I mean, one of the worst things about salespeople is that we're like super optimistic and, and we just, you know, John's your guy. It's like, great, I'm in love with John now. He's going to help me get this deal done. And it turns out John is a fan who has no power and no authority, right? So. Um, I would say a little, there's a degree of skepticism that they're always bringing, but with a higher degree of accuracy. So I would lean more on the skeptic side. Oh, sorry, they gave me the mic. Um, oh, sorry. That's okay. I have, end up, I have too many things in my hand. Uh, how do you test a champion? <clears throat> yeah, so um, it's an interesting thing. You know, so, so part of it is you need to be looking at kind of their level in the org chart. And if you understand the decision making and the buying process, you should have some sense of how important they are in things. Um, if you're dealing with a sales leader, you could, they get it, right? So you can just kind of ask them, like, hey, like, will you be my champion? Um, <clears throat> there are, that's a harder one to do, right? So one of the ideas that's thrown in there is when you're talking about the competitors, if they'll talk to you about who the competitors are. Um, I think that a good question to ask any champion is, hey, based on what you know about 15.5 so far, are we the recommended vendor? And if they say, yes, you're the recommended vendor, it's like, okay, great. What do you plan to do about that now? And if they don't plan to do a whole lot about it, they're not a champion for you. Um, and if you're not the recommended vendor, you still have some work you need to do uh, to convert this person who could be a champion into somebody who can actually do something for you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so part of the thing on MedPick, right, is that you shouldn't be doing it on all your deals. Like, if you've got a $4,000 deal, don't waste your time on MedPick, right? You've got a $40,000 deal, like, you better be covering all your bases with something like MedPick. Um, I'll give you a short answer to this question, but I'm happy to chat with you offline later about it because it's a pretty in-depth question that you're asking. Um, this is, this, this process of MedPick is not about helping you to scale a team. It's about just winning deals. And so I don't care how many sellers you have. If you've got somebody who's reasonably competent and you've got an important deal, they should be following MedPick. It's not, this is not a complicated process, right? It's a checklist that they should just be thorough about if they care about this individual deal. And so where it becomes harder and where I don't think the you know, you can get in these places where you're literally scoring this stuff up and say, so I can say, I've got 10 sales reps and um, I've got 40 deals and all these, you know, and I've, I've got all of them scored on MedPick and so overall my deal health is a 13. Right? So, well, that doesn't mean anything when you've got a small team. So, like, don't even waste your time on that stuff. But um, as things grow and they do get bigger, you can start to look at the, the pipeline health in a more global way based on the numbers that you're getting in. But remember, it's, it's a max of 16 and a low of zero. So, and, and the one thing that's a little bit tough for me on MedPick is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't correlate to stages. Or like, if you're in the discovery stage, you're not going to be at a 16. <laughs> you know, you might be like a 5, and maybe a 5 is really good, given how early stage that deal is. So that's one of the things also that you need to be sensitive to as things are scaling. <laughs> I'm loud. Yeah. 
So I'm a big fan, when you're saying what do I do first, I'm a fan of getting the champion first. The problem with fans is that you can waste so much time with these people. They love you, right? And they'll tell you all the information, but they don't do anything or they can't do anything or nobody, they just don't have enough respect and power inside of the organization. And so they're really valuable people to have involved in your deal so you can get a lot of helpful information. And one of the things is like, we didn't talk about this at all today, but like do not get single threaded in a deal. If you have a demo and four people show up to your demo and all you do is maintain the relationship with your main point of contact and you ignore the other three people, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Like that is the dumbest thing to do. Go back to all four people immediately after the demo with individual messages to each of them that says, what'd you think? What are your concerns about 15.5? What'd you like? So if you can, you want to build relationships with fans, but the problem is that we so often forget that they're a fan and we think they're a champion. And we delude ourselves and we get optimistic around the wrong stuff. So that's the biggest risk in that. But I'm always a believer that you call high and, and good things happen because if a champion with power turns to the, the person that you don't know yet as a fan and says, hey, go work on this and figure it out, uh, that person should just do what they were told, <laughs> right? But if you tell the fan to go like, hey, go call your boss, the boss is like, ah, okay, <laughs> I got stuff to do. <laughs> I'm not listening to you. <laughs> so Let's give Brad that. a round of applause. Brad, great, great work. Really impressive. The next presenter, I've actually also cold called and sold to, uh, which is great. Jeff Perkins. There are a lot of amazing things about Jeff Perkins that I'm about to explain. And there's one bad thing, but I'm going to get to that bad thing in a little bit. Jeff Perkins is the CMO of Park Mobile, over 10 million users. He is like the, if, if Jeff Perkins comes on your team, you're either going to get an influx of cash or you're going to get acquired. It just kind of happens like that, I swear. Before Park Mobile, he worked at QA Symphony, where he increased, uh, built the brand, and then also increased revenue by 500%. Worked at PGI, Auto Trader, is an Emory graduate, um, is a Peloton guy. In his introduction, he wants to make sure anyone who wants to challenge him on the Peloton, he's bald guy, come at him, bro. Park Mobile, recently acquired by BMW. They are absolutely one of Atlanta's success stories. The one thing he did conveniently leave off here is Jeff is a Phillies fan and an Eagles fan. But don't let that ruin this because he's one of the best marketers in Atlanta. Let's give Jeff Perkins a round of applause. Uh, Jeff. Thanks, man. Thanks. Nice. Can you guys hear me? Good? Good? Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for coming out today uh, for this session. This will this should be should be fun. Um, so yes, like Johnny said, uh, Park Mobile. Um, let me, let me just, uh, has everyone here heard of Park Mobile or everyone's a Park Mobile user? All right, quiz. Can anyone tell me the uh, zone number at Pont City Market? 222. Two, two. All right. One thing we do really well when you're at a small company is you give away a lot of swag. Um, as a marketer, I don't just look at it as giving away premium items. I look at it as creating human billboards, right? Very, something very scrappy. More of you should be wearing your, uh, your, your brand uniforms here. Uh, yeah, but Park Mobile, we're a great uh, success story locally. We just, uh, we're actually about to hit the 11 million user milestone. We had about a million users every 90 days now. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing company, um, and we're doing really cool things. We've solved one of those weird problems that no one has figured out how to solve, is how do you make parking a little easier, a little smarter? Um, there's a lot of pain that comes along with that that I have to deal with on social media on a daily basis when parking doesn't work out and people get ticketed after they use the app, but that's, that's part of the fun challenge. But we do about, every day, about 250,000 parking transactions across the country. So we're, everyone knows us here probably from Atlanta, but we're really all over the place in all the major cities. So really um, fun company, fun story. Um, like John said, la uh, this year has been a really good year for me. Usually I come up in front of an audience and bemo bemoaning, I'm like the long-suffering Phillies fan. Um, I don't know how it happened that this team with a backup quarterback won the Super Bowl, uh, but if you really want to geek out, um, I wrote a blog post about it. It's, uh, it's on uh, singlemindedproposition.com, my blog. It's about 10,000 words. 
Uh, my wife read the first paragraph, and she's like, I can't read this shit. So <laughs> just a fair warning. Um, I say I'm from Philly. Uh, I'm from a part of Philadelphia. A lot of people call southern New Jersey. Um, so Jersey people here? What exit? Uh, Cherry Hill. You're exit four, just like me. I'm Cherry Hill. There we go, man. What exit? Fallsboro. Nice, nice. See, this is what happens when you get Jersey people together. It becomes the New Jersey support group, all the Jersey plant, transplants that came down here. Uh, but from Jersey, like a good Jersey kid, huge Springsteen fan. I'm going to talk about Springsteen a little bit later in the show, but seen him 32 times. Um, and, and like Brad, I have also kids, so this is like the, uh, another video of kids. So, so Brad showed his kid playing sports. Um, what I do with my kids is I, I do my presentations in front of them before I present. So this was yesterday, um, and, and I just completed the presentation. So let's, let's see some uh, reaction from my daughters. So what do you guys think of my presentation? I that was the most boring thing in the world. It's the worst. What do you mean? What was, the, what was boring about it? You talked and you talked and it you talked and you talked. It was boring. boring. Really? We never wanted I just to said, do that again. Well, yeah. marketing is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what would make it better, do you think? I think if you added some unicorns. And candy. OK. So does anyone think um, I'm not open to con uh, constructive feedback on my presentation? So there we go, unicorns and candy. So uh, earlier part of my career, I worked at some big companies. Uh, here locally, I worked at Auto Trader PGI. I had worked at the agency side, working for Procter & Gamble, GlaxoSmithKline. So I've always lived in this kind of like universe where you have $50 million budgets and you could spend it in a lot of different things and you were sort of accountable, but, but not really. And you didn't ever have to think about uh, being scrappy and what do you do if you don't have any marketing budget to spend. Um, and I had always had kind of had this itch to go do something more entrepreneurial. Um, and, and it was hard because like life at big companies is good. This is Auto Trader annual meeting. That is Kid Rock at an internal company annual meeting. <laughs> it's hard sometimes to walk away from these big opportunities, but I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. Um, so I joined a company locally called QA Symphony. QA Symphony actually came out of Tech Village, short stint here. Um, and so I went from working in the Terminus building, which is, which is super nice if you guys haven't been to the Terminus building. Um, so I went from that. Uh, and then I, we went into this building. Uh, this is Security Center. And we had like, like a closet, basically. Um, so it was a different scale. I had to go buy my own desk, go buy my own computer. There's no IT guys there to, to help me set it up. But we had a really, really good run at QA Symphony. And I learned some really valuable lessons on how to market a company when you don't have any budget to market a company. And, and I think that's something probably, I assume there's a lot of founders here, um, a lot of people working in startups. That's something you have to figure out if you're in a startup. Because not doing marketing is not an option. But the difference between a big company and going to a small company is you still have to do marketing. You actually have to do a much better job, though because you have to do a lot with a little bit of money. So uh, I'll talk about things I learned um, going from enterprise to startup and how to make a big impact on, on a small budget. So the first thing, and, and, and this is the most important thing for startup founders, and it's probably the hardest thing. Um, you know, There are shiny objects everywhere, but you have to focus. So I, I'm sure some of you may have seen this. This is the chart that outlines all of the marketing technology available um, to buy today. So if you're a CMO like me, this really sucks because all these guys, all these sales reps are calling me every day trying to sell me all of this stuff. Um, but the truth is, with, with all these tools out there, um, you probably don't need much of it or any of it. And, and, and there's nothing automated about doing marketing today. Everyone will sell you on these big dreams, but if you don't have the people, the processes, uh, it's not going to work. So you have to avoid these shiny objects. You have to avoid uh, the, the silver bullet to all of your problems. Um, you also, this is a, a, a mindset you have to have. You, you can do anything, but you can't do everything, especially as a startup, right? There's so much on your plate, but focus is key. Focus is critical. And we used to do an exercise at QA Symphony where we had very small budgets, and, and it was very simple. It was a fill in the blanks exercise, right? What is our one biggest problem as a business? It could be we're not growing revenue faster because of blank. We're losing customers because of blank. 
and you focus 100% of your mind share as a marketer on how do I fill in the blank? How do I fix that one problem for the business? And everything else becomes noise. Everything else becomes noise. Um, two, knowing your buyer. Knowing your buyer is critical, right? Um, so I'm going to throw some stats at you right now. Buyers are about 70% of the way through the purchase process before they ever engage with a sales rep, right? So they're learning about you before you're even talking to them. 81% of B2B buyers are doing research online. 59% of buyers prefer to do research online rather than talk to your sales rep. And then where are they going online? They're going to Google. Google is a huge resource. Not necessarily they're doing the digging of in on research on Google, but Google is a place where they start the research process at different stages of the buying cycle. All right? So the point is if you are weak online, you're going to be weak offline. You could have the best sales guys in the world, but if your website is not good and you're not optimized for the search engines, no one will find you. First point. Um, we spent an inordinate amount of time at QA Symphony focused on SEO. Because we realized our buyers, if they wanted to buy a tool, and QA Symphony made a tool for software testing, software testing tools. The number one term they were using was software testing tools. So our goal was to rank number one for software testing tools. Now that took a lot of time, energy. It didn't necessarily cost us from an ad spend perspective, though. Um, and you can see what we did. We said, all right, we need to rank number one. So in, August 2016, we were 57. Content, through a lot of link building, we ended up at number one. And that number one, because we tracked it, generated hundreds of thousands of dollars for our business. Hundreds of thousands of dollars from going from 57 to number one. So as you're thinking about your business, think about the search engines, think about SEO, think about what are those key terms those buyers are looking up on Google and make sure you have a plan to rank for it, right? Uh, and this is the growth you saw. So as you improve in SEO, your website traffic will grow from 7,500 in 2015 to almost 40,000 in 2017. During this stage, our company went from $1 million to $10 million ARR, and we raised $40 million Series C. A lot of it driven by this, by the fact that 80% of our leads, 80% of our closed one deals were coming in from marketing leads. So this is what was driving it. This is what was driving it. Three, get your name out there any way you can. One strategy we found really effective was, was not going to these big industry publications, right? Not going to the industry publications that will charge you a lot of money. We found what we called the watering holes. Where are our buyers going to get information, to connect with each other, and how can we be a part of that conversation? So in the software testing space, there were all these like, little bloggy websites out there like um, softwaretesting.com, softwaretestingclub.com. I'm sure these are sites that you guys are going to every morning to get your QA news. Um, but every one of these sites on every one of these pages had a list of the top software testing tools. All right? Like tons of sites that had all these lists. And we were on all these lists. And we were like number 10 or number 7. And so, what we did is we said, well, what kind of traffic are these lists driving into our site? And we looked, we are like, actually, we're getting a lot of people from these sites onto our site. So let's, let's start a relationship with these publishers. Um, a lot of these publishers actually happen to be in India. So we reached out to all these publishers. And we said, hey, um, can you re-review our product? Because we think we're, we're better than number seven. We think we're better than kind of your, the, the guys ahead of us. And they said, well, if you pay us $1,000, we'll make you number one. Um, so, so being the good marketing guy, I negotiated him down to $800. <laughs> but, so we became number one on all of these sites. So if anyone was Googling what's the best software testing tool, and they got to any of these sites, our product, which was called QTest, was number one on all of these sites. And when, when we close one a deal, when we close one any deal, I would always jump on the call with the, the, the customer right after we closed one. I said, just tell me this. How did you find out about QTest? Because we were a smaller company. How did you find out? Well, I Googled, and I started going to all these review sites, and you guys were number one on every list. So I put you on my short list, even though I didn't know who you were. These are big enterprise clients. So the watering hole strategy is a key one, watering hole strategy. Um, don't pay for things you can do for free. So a lot of publications are going to call you. You're going to say, hey, for $5,000, I'm going to do a webinar for your business. And I'm going to get you 
200 guaranteed leads for $5,000. Um, so we said, well, maybe we don't need to do that. Why don't we do our own webinar series? So we did it ourselves. It was all our content. We owned it. We started promoting it to our database. We promoted it to all our prospects. We promoted it to all our customers. Um, this was actually one of the first webinars we did. 1,934 people showed up. We were crushing any publication in the industry because they, they liked the topic. It was interesting. It was relevant content. Um, don't pay for things you can do for free. We did one webinar a month. Our average attendance on a webinar was anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people. And when we tracked deals in the pipeline, almost every deal we closed won, they had attended a webinar at some point. It's a great way to accelerate deals in the pipeline. Applying for awards is usually not, does not cost anything. Um, I'm really big into applying for awards. If you're a small company, apply for every award you can. Uh, it's critical. You want to start getting these logos on your website. It's so important, right? And meet the local press. Um, all the local press will talk to you if you reach out to them. Build these relationships with the local press. Make sure they know who you are. Um, you know, I, I met Dana Barrett through Twitter. I just reached out to her. The next week I was on her show. Same with Atlanta Tech Edge, which unfortunately is not around anymore. Reach out to local press. It's a great way to get your name out there in the local technology community. Thinking big. When you're a small company and you have small budgets, the tendency is to think, well, I can't, I can't do any really cool stuff that like Sales Loft is doing or Terminus is doing. You know, I just can't do that stuff, Jeff. I, I don't have enough budget. Um, you you got to take a shot sometime. And so our shot at QA Symphony was a user conference. We said, we're going to bring all of our clients into a room. We're going to bring our prospects into a room. And we're going to spend a lot of money on this. And we're going to go into it knowing we're not going to make any money. We're going to lose money on it. So we saw it not as a, a conference that would make us any money, but a marketing initiative, a way to bring people together. And so we did a conference. It was called Quality Jam. Um, it, honestly, one of the scariest things I've ever done, because you kind of open up the ticket sales, and no tickets get sold, and you realize you have to give away all the tickets. But year one, we had uh, 150 people show up. It was a pretty good result. Year two, we had uh, 450 people show up. And this is a picture from year two. Um, so we were able to really dramatically increase the attendance there. And what was really cool is that after the conference, um, we got this email from a client that he had sent to his whole executive team. This is a Fortune 500 client, very important for the company. I've gone from being skeptically interested in QA Symphony to seeing QTest as my personal preferred solution for test management. QA Symphony customers are like the people I see at mixed martial arts fights, cheering their fighter on in the cage. These are legitimate customers I spoke with, like Home Depot, Sony, Salesforce, Barclays, Disney. The company has a solid growing user base. They are well funded. And in my opinion, from meeting everyone from the CEO down in, down in the company, they have some of the best and brightest people, like a mini Google in Atlanta. This was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my career, to be honest with you. In my, like, like, I, like Dave Kyle, who's the CEO, came into my office and showed it to me. I was like, we should like retire now. If only we had the money retired, because it doesn't get better than this. Getting a hot prospect in a room with your current customers and seeing this feedback after the fact. So it was a very, very successful event for us. So that was our big thing. Quality Jam has gone on. This year, they did it. Uh, they had almost 800 people there. And it's gone global. They now do it in London. So really, really great event to showcase the company, the talent, and the product. Being the brand. Um, as founders, as people who are doing marketing in a company, especially companies that are early stage, your job is to be the chief Kool-Aid drinker. If you're not excited about the company, no one is going to be excited about the company. I would always go, I'm on vacation, I'm always wearing my company swag. This is at the top of a mountain in Colorado. Um, and, and, and you take it personally if people mess with your brand. And this is something that one of our competitors was doing. At, you know, so it was a competitor called Zephyr. So they were buying our name in Google and they were saying, they were putting up an ad that says, QA Symphony beats HP Quality Center for testing and driving to a Zephyr landing page. Totally unethical, totally against Google's terms of service, but they weren't getting caught. No one was watching. So I could have gone and said, all right, I'm going to go to the lawyers. I'm going to tell you know, the lawyers at Google that they have to take this down. But I just shamed them on Twitter. Um, so, so I called them out. And then we got into back and forth, and you know, I was kind of taking screenshots, and I was showing all the stuff that they, they were doing. Um, and it came down that day. It came down that day. If you think about that, a legal process with Google could have taken a couple weeks. But because we were scrappy, because we're a startup, 
We just said, let's take matters into our own hands. Again, someone messes with my brand as the founder, as the head of marketing, I'm gonna be very aggressive in pushing back. And then I got back kind of into a back and forth with them and it was fun and then I saw them at a trade show and there was almost a fight. It was, it was a whole thing, but, but again, again, this is your brand. You gotta love your brand, but when you're a small company, you could be scrappy like this. I wouldn't do this every, you know, if this doesn't go well for you, don't blame me, but I'm just saying this worked well for me. Um, and the last point, back to my Springsteen analogy, uh, what would Springsteen do? So um, I love this quote, getting an audience is hard, sustaining an audience is hard, it dem demands a consistency of thought, purpose, and action over a long period of time, right? Um, Bruce has one of the biggest followings of any band out there, he's in his mid to late 60s, he's still performing, he's got a Broadway show right now. Um, I saw him, this is probably two years ago in New York. I just want to play this. So why I show that to you is because that was our, that was three hours and 54 minutes into the show. And everybody's going bananas. And it, it was like, he's got this thing where he wants everyone at that show to come away with something special and something magical. And I think about that with our customers. And it's, it's not the same thing. People are very passionate about music. But there are things you can do within your business to create raving fans, just like Springsteen creates raving fans. Um, I'll show you a couple examples. This is a, a woman who had tweeted to the, the Gaylord Hotel about a, a noise machine they had. And she's like, what's that noise machine? And the Gaylord tweeted back, like, it's this noise machine. You can go get it. Um, and she tweeted back to them, no, that's not the right one. It doesn't have this certain sound. So for some reason, the Gaylord Hotel had this very unique noise machine. And so the next time this person went to stay at the hotel, they gave her one. Kind of cute. But you can see, uh, you reaffirm that there are still companies out there focused on great service. You've made, me, you've made a lifelong fan out of me. Um, this is a very famous story, Peter Shankman, consultant. Um, he was flying into New York Airport. He jokingly tweeted to Morton's that he would love them to meet him there with a steak, and Morton's met him there with a steak, right? Um, and even at, at Park Mobile, we had a guy give us a one-star review, a one-star review on, um, on the iTunes store. Uh, but the reason he gave us a one-star review is because we, we basically ruined his date because he couldn't figure out the app, and. He was trying to, it was the only way to park, and, and this whole thing, it was Valentine's Day, and we totally ruined his date. Um, so we actually sent him a gift card to the restaurant so he could go on a second date, and then we use that in social media. But again, there are little things you can do with your customers that don't require a ton of investment uh, to make them feel special, that will build that affinity towards your business, that will create those raving fans for the long term. So the question is, what are you doing in your business today to create those raving fans? So, so that's kind of uh, 20 quick minutes on, on how to make a big impact with a small budget. I think we have a couple minutes for questions, so happy to, happy to take them now. Really, really good. Cool. Anyone have some questions? Great. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the best methods for marketing your webinar? So the, what we found was that the, be, the best methods were always to start with our database, start with our customers. Um, there were also these really uh, niche newsletters in the, in the category that were super cheap to use. So rather than paying $5,000 to go with a big publication that would do a webinar for you, we'd pay like 100 bucks to do an e-blast to the market. Um, and that worked really well. The key to webinars, though, it's not necessarily just the audience. It's, it's two things. It's the speaker and the topic. Speaker and the topic. So one thing that worked really well for us was bringing in thought leaders from around the industry to do these webinars with us. Um, this was really specific. Software testers love webinars. I don't know what it was. They, they, they don't love going to conferences as much because I think human interaction doesn't turn them on. But the webinar where they can be in front of a screen, they really like. So for us, that worked really well. But again, the speaker and, and the, uh, the topic are the two key things. And then using every platform, using your database, uh, using social media, all those things drove a ton of webinar signups for us. Questions. And I will recommend um, 
On24 is a really good plat. If you want to go all in on webinars, On24 is a great platform for it um, because they, a lot, the problem with a lot of webinars, once you go on 100 attendees, they don't scale. So be, if you're going to go to 1,000 attendees on a webinar, On24 gives you like a self-service tool that you can do the webinars. You don't have to pay a bunch of money to have all these managed webinars, which gets really expensive. Yes. Okay, my question's probably not super relatable, but for my personal business, I find that people, because I have such a large following on social media, I find that people are more feeding into, like like Brad was talking about, like you have like the fans and like people are feeding more into me as an individual. I wanted to know like how could I market my product and my business more to where people are, f the same way they're feeding to me as an individual, or like liking and keeping up with the things that I do, how can mm -hmm. I get them, like how can I market my my product to get them to buy more into the business. And I guess like me the same way, but right. just like get that fan base this way. Yeah, it, it, that's a great question. Uh, I, you know, having a strong personal brand, especially if you're a founder or you're an executive in a startup, um, having a strong personal brand actually helps drive your business. I firmly believe that. Um, so what I, I would tell you not to do is to start hawking your product by, through your personal brand, right? Um, be you, be authentic. That's clearly what's growing your social media audience right now. Um, but casually letting people know what you're doing and making sure they are, they're aware that you're running this business or you have this product, um, there's nothing wrong with that. You always have to walk that line though, but um, just because you feel like you're not selling your product through social media, you actually are. You actually are. So keep doing what you're doing, keep building your following. Because um, if people like you They'll, they'll say, hey, how do I figure out what she's doing? Oh, she's doing this product. Well, I like her, so it's that halo onto the product. So don't use your platform, your personal platform, to sell. Just build your personal brand, and that'll halo onto your, um, your professional products. What's your biggest takeaway going from B to B to B to C? So you're a QA Symphony, super B to B sell, right? Yeah. Now Park Mobile, no one's doing webinars on parking. We are actually. Are we you are. really? Yeah. <laughs> well we, have to, we, have a, we have to sell to someone, <laughs> municipalities and parking garage operators. It's a oh, different kind okay, of webinar. I got it. I got it. Um, no, so, so yeah, so at Park Mobile, it's B2B and B2C. Um, sometimes B2B2C, sometimes um, B2G. So it's, uh, you, know, you know, I've, I've worked B2B and B2C almost my whole career. Um, I, so, so I tend not to, to silo myself into like being a B2B marketer or B2C marketer. Um, the, the tactics are different, the tools are different, but at the end of the day, you know, the best marketers are able to figure out who their audience is, get really deep in knowledge on that audience, and then develop the right plan with the right tactics to attract that audience. And so whether you're B2B or B2C, those are the things you're doing. You just have sometimes different, different things you're doing across you know, the tactics and, and how you understand the audience. So I, I don't know, I, I don't think it's, I, I never think it's that different most of the industry disagrees. <laughs> um, most say, you know, I'm a B2B guy or I'm a B2C guy. I've kind of enjoyed both. It gives you a variety in work. Um, you know, I, and it's weird because I'm going from QA Symphony, which was like hardcore B2B, targeting software testers, targeting IT professionals. Now I'm targeting, you know, people in Alexandria, Virginia who commute into Washington, D.C., and I have to get outdoor and radio on. Um, I know for me, that it's that variety that makes marketing kind of fun. Um, so I, I never think there's a, a huge difference because as long as you're doing the fundamentals right, whether you're B2B or B2C, it should, it should still work. What's your criteria for moving out of stealth mode mm -hmm. and what traditional criteria and what do you think about the way blockchain apps are being marketed? <sighs> um, I, blockchain apps, so that's a really interesting one because I mean, blockchain apps have been were preceded by this like huge like Bitcoin changing the world, and I, you know I, I think the apps are at a disadvantage because the expectations have been so high. Um, but I think if I were marketing blockchain or, or anything related to blockchain or Bitcoin, the first thing I would do is try to help people figure out what it is and why it's valuable. And I think that's the thing the industry has missed. Um, you know, like how many people here could give me a good dissertation on, on blockchain or what it means and why it's valuable to them? I mean, I get hit up all the time because we do 
hardcore financial transactions at, at Park Mobile, 250,000 credit card transactions every day. And we're constantly getting hit up by people that are saying, hey, you should take Bitcoin. And we're like, but we study our customers. Nobody, none of our customers, and we, mat, we reach a very mass audience. No one's using Bitcoin to transact. So I, I don't know. I, I, it, I don't know if I'm answering your question that well. But um, you know, I, I think I think that's specifically a challenging one because the industry expectations are so high, and the products that have been out have kind of been underwhelming. Now I will say, if you're thinking about how, when to come out of stealth mode, when to come out of stealth mode, um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I generally think the best thing to do as a startup is, is have a good product, get a couple customers using the product, and once you have at least one case study of a customer who's willing to say, hey, I use this product and it helped me, then as a marketer, then it's game on. Then it's game on. But if you don't have a customer, you just have a cool concept, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. So, so get that customer, get a few customers, and once you have it, it's going to be really powerful. One of the most powerful things that our customers told us at QA Symphony, and, we, and it's like right at, on the website above the fold, it was a list of our customers. It was our logos of our biggest customers at the time. And we were working with like small pockets in Barclays and a small pocket in Office Depot and a small pocket in Nordstrom. So we had only sold each of those businesses like probably five or 10 seats each. But the fact we had those logos on our website, that made all the difference as far as getting us on the short list and getting us to an evaluation. Um, yeah, so have you ever had experience marketing a horizontal product uh, versus you know, a specific vertical product like you've been talking for both of these? Because that's part of what we struggle with mm -hmm. is we have application across all sorts of different industries and buyers. So yeah, I mean, it's um, what, what's are different products for different industries, or one product that goes across uh, different. Uh, yeah, same product set that can be, okay. go across. Yeah, I mean, we have the same thing at QA Symphony in a way because uh, we targeted specific industries. So, healthcare had a very different IT need or a different QA need than financial services, than e-commerce retail, than software companies. Those are our four key verticals. Um, one thing that we had a lot of success with. In, in marketing to key verticals. And we actually, we tried a lot of things. Sometimes we had salespeople that were very focused on a vertical. That's a good strategy generally, especially if it's knowledgeable salespeople that know the industry. Um, we developed custom content for each vertical. That was the big thing that we found really helped. So we had an ebook about um, electronic health records and QA testing. We had an ebook about financial services and security and QA testing. And we even did things on the back end of our website. So if you were coming to our site, there's a tool called DemandBase that lets you do this. There are other tools as well. But if you were coming to our site and we IP tracked you and knew that you were coming in financial from a financial services industry, you would see a different message. So it would all be about financial services. If you were coming in from healthcare, you would see a different message about healthcare. It would show you logos of our healthcare clients. Um, that, that was very successful for us. Because when you have a buyer coming in, and probably their first interaction with you is going to be on your website, you don't want to seem like a guy who doesn't know their industry. right? So that was really important. So we were able to serve up key content that made, made them think that we were experts in their industry. Let's give Jeff a round of applause. You'll be around at the happy hour, Jeff? Yep. Yeah, great. I'd like to introduce Jonathan Manuzak. He's the CTO of CodeGuard, recently acquired. And yeah, that was great. Uh, he is overseeing the product architecture, engineering efforts for product management. He's basically develop, lead developer from day one all the way to acquisition. And I can remember when Jonathan and his CEO, Dave, David, they have. They were in the ATDC for two years, and they've stayed kind of, kind of stealth, just focusing on the customer, building a great product, and you know, voila, over another overnight success story. And so, I can't wait to see your presentation from prototype to minimum viable product. Please welcome to the stage, Jonathan Manuzak. Thanks, John. All right, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a good break. 
got a chance to get some snacks and some waters, get reinvigorated. I know this isn't an easy time of the day. Um, I'll try to be entertaining as, as best I can. Uh, I did want to share a little bit of my background, uh, a little more than what, uh, what John said, just to maybe contextualize some of the things that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, before coming down to Atlanta, I worked at a little company called IBM. Um, at the end of my time there, I was leading what they called the SEAL team. And I'm sure at some point in the 80s, that was a fun acronym for something. Um, but what it meant for me was I had a team of engineers, QA people, and um, customer service professionals. And we would get dropped into these tough customer uh, engagements. We'd be building custom features. We'd be uh, fixing integration issues, mostly in cases where they got sold something that the product couldn't quite deliver on. Um, but it was a big organization. Uh, came down to Atlanta about eight years ago and uh, joined as the first full-time employee at CodeGuard. Um, coming from IBM, this is a pretty stark change. We had no process. We had a prototype that was under development, but we had to kind of invent everything else to, to go around that to make it successful. And uh, as was mentioned, sometime between the time I was talking to the organizers about doing this and today, we announced that we were acquired by Komodo CA. Um, it's a bigger organization than CodeGuard, so now we're kind of feeling our way through what that looks like, taking our product and our team and integrating with a bigger organization. So these are things, well, we can skip ahead. Uh, <laughs> I, um, this has been kind of a reflective time for me post-acquisition, you know, thinking about the things that I've learned, being grateful for all the things that I've learned, all the opportunities that I had, and kind of thinking more about this talk um, I came up with you know, five things that I think could be relevant for an audience here, you know, potentially thinking back to the early days and how we grew to the acquisition. So this was five lessons I've learned or things I wish I learned 10 years ago. Uh, the first is well-defined product management, project management. Now when you talk about project management and a team of engineers, it invariably devolves into this conversation about tools and tooling and you know, mostly complaints about JIRA. But, among all the shiny features and integrations and you know, uh, Slack chat bots, I think transparency is the best feature. It's important for these tools that you choose to use to be able to show your team where you have been, what you're doing now, and where you're going. And I think that having the team be able to see that on their own without having it delivered to them like happened at IBM is a, a great feature. You also have to be open to new information. And I don't mean just being open-minded, but your processes have to be open to new information. You have to be able to incorporate all the things that you're learning into your project management process. Um, depending on where you are in your product development cycle, um, you might be learning more every week than you have ever before. You're learning about the market. You're learning about customers. This is uh, an opportunity for you to take that feedback, bring it in, and deliver it to the customer, those things you're learning. So your process has to be adaptable, regardless of what tools you're using. I think that uh, among all the shiny tools, a shared spreadsheet is really undervalued. Um, there's a lot of things that these tools are great at, but being able to quickly input things, slice and dice, move things around, um, aren't necessarily great features of these products. Um, so something that uh, you should definitely consider as you're thinking about building new features, building new products, why not make the, the simplest and transparent uh, choice? <laughs> Estimating. So for uh, software engineers, this is a perennial topic. Estimations are really, really hard. If you have some sort of external deadline and you really need those estimates to make sure that you're going to hit it or know that you're not, go for it. But day to day, I would recommend if you don't need them, that you should try to avoid doing super granular, how many minutes is this going to take you estimation. And lastly, but definitely not least, you have to talk to each other a lot. The product team doesn't work. The engineering team doesn't work if there's not communication. Transparency is a big part of that, but you also need to be able to have discourse around the things that you're working on. And whether that's uh, you know, in a Trello card, or in a GitHub issue, or in daily stand-ups, there has to be communication. Two, pick a metric. Excuse me. So these metrics have to help your team answer the question, how are things going right now?
it's hard for a high performance engineering team to focus on a bunch of things at once, especially in the early days, especially when things aren't going super great. They're not stable. So you have to pick one thing to focus on. This metric has to be important above all else, and your team has to feel empowered to do things that affect that metric. Whatever the metric is that you choose, you have to be able to create it automatically, and it has to be visible. If you can't generate it automatically, if you're waiting for somebody to go run a report and post it you know, on the refrigerator in the kitchen, then it's probably not going to be super useful for the team. Everybody needs to be able to see these metrics. They should be able to be updated and as close to real time as possible. And the metric can totally change. In fact, it should change. As your business evolves, as your product evolves, these things have to change. It should still be tightly aligned with whatever the business or product goals are. You know, this example here is our backup success metric. It is, when I took the screenshot, and it still is today, 100% for today and the last seven days. That's something that we worked really hard on. It took singular focus to get there, but it's not the only thing we've ever focused on. We've also looked at things like churn, or trial conversions, or revenue, or uh, Amazon costs. These are all things that we've looked at at different phases of the product. And again, this might be a theme today, but you have to talk about the metric a lot. You, as leaders, have to set the expectation to the team of what this metric needs to look like, what happens if it doesn't look the way that it needs to, and what is the path for getting there from wherever we are today to what we think success is for the metric. Thoughtful operations. So I'm talking more here about development operations, engineering operations, infrastructure operations, not so much business operations. And again, we have this you know, glut of tools that we can use to make our lives easier. And we absolutely should try to use all these tools to make our lives, to make our engineers' lives easier. Um, documentation is wonderful. Local tests are great. But you should automate end to end from the developer that starts day one to the production deploy. Everything in between should be automated to the extent possible. Virtualization and containerization, two buzzwords, but they're super helpful in this case. If you are able to virtualize and containerize your application, you know this is specific for SaaS tools, but if you're able to virtualize it, then it looks really similar for the engineers that are working on it and what's actually happening in production. It reduces those issues of, well, this doesn't happen for me locally. If you guys can make it closer, make the environments look closer together. It also gets your team out of the business of trying to troubleshoot each other's development environments. If there's no cost for blowing it away and trying again, that makes it a lot easier than what dependency did you break? What side project were you working on when you overwrote this? That kind of thing. And this, optimized for first run success, I think is the, the key to all of these smooth engineering operations. You want to be able to have somebody that comes in on the first day get up and running quickly. It's great for morale for that person that's getting started. It's also great morale for the rest of the team that doesn't have to help them and hold their hand as they go up, walk through you know, a 50 steps of uh, documentation to get up and running. And while, yes, automation is awesome, uh, it does have to be maintained. Maintenance, in this case, is not a bad thing. It means things are changing. It means your product is evolving. It means your infrastructure is potentially changing and growing and becoming more resilient. But it does have to be updated. And you should budget for that as part of your project management. And <laughs> unlike the, the last two, this is something you should talk about only when it's needed. This should largely, while it will be an investment to get up and running first, this is something you shouldn't have to be revisiting all the time. If you get to the point where you are separating your infrastructure operations from the engineering team, then it makes sense to have a conversation. But otherwise, just keep moving it forward, making sure your production environment and your product, or excuse me, your development environment and your production environment are as close as reasonably possible. Number four, home stretch. Customer support. And I put support in the scare quotes here because I don't think that that's the right way to think about it, especially in early stage SaaS companies. Um, I think the way that we talk about things, the words that we use to communicate internally are also important. So notice I didn't say user support. These aren't users, these are customers, they're paying us. And I think support could better be called something like customer success or customer excellence. I think a lot of this has to do with creating the right tone and relationship between the person that's answering the phone or manning the chat and the person on the other end. I think that particularly for SaaS companies, 
customer success or whatever you choose to call it has to be an engineering discipline. Um, it is the engineers that are building the product. It's the engineers that are managing the service that the customers are paying for. So if there's a disconnect between engineering and the customer, there's going to be problems that arise because of it. And I think everybody's probably familiar with the, the technology adoption lifecycle here, crossing the chasm and all that. Um, I only bring this up because, especially for early stage companies, um, you have to understand where your product is along this curve. Um, if you get posted on Product Hunt or featured in Hacker News, the feedback that you're going to get, the feature requests that you're going to get, may be different from what you are uh, intending your audience to be somewhere in the middle of the majority because you're talking to a bunch of super early adopters. So just something to be cognizant of as you're you know, starting to get out there into the world and talking to customers. Now mistakes definitely happen. CodeGuard, we've been around for going on eight years now. We had a mistake last week that could have been bad, could have led to customer data loss. Never good when that happens. It's especially never good when a customer finds it before you do, if it gets out of your QA process. But when things like that happen, you have to own it. You can't just say, oops, sorry. You have to say, wow, that's really bad. What can we do to, one, make you successful in whatever it is you're trying to do right now? And two, what can we do to make this better so that it never happens again? And unlike what I've talked about previously, I think this is an area where you should be wary of automation. It's really easy and really addictive to start firing off those canned responses and text snippets that say, okay, sorry, go look at our documentation. But if you eliminate the opportunity for somebody with a brain to investigate and you know, potentially resolve the issue, you're missing out on a lot of potential product growth. And again, this is a theme. You have to talk about it a lot. You have to have internal champions for your customers that are bringing up these issues that keep recurring. You have to have champions that say, wow, this is really a problem for our super high-end customer where we're going to go, or you know, the kind of customer that we want to acquire. So it's important to be talking about this and building in time to resolve issues that are occurring for customers. And last but not least, the, the team. I definitely don't want to step on the, the people talk that's going to happen here shortly. But when I'm talking to people in the community, team building, recruiting, that is the, uh, the topic of the day, especially in this market. It's absolutely hard, and being a leader on a high-performance engineering team, part of your job, whether you like it or not, is going to be recruiting. Um, it's really challenging because a lot of the people that are really good aren't out looking for jobs. They're not throwing their resume around. They're not you know, actively seeking something. So it's super challenging to find people to build the relationship so that when the timing is right, you can get them on board. Internal referrals. This is, this is kind of something that it will happen organically, uh, especially if you're not overtly paying for these referrals to happen internally. Um, but there's something you have to take really seriously. If somebody that you've already hired that's already on your team is coming to you and saying, here's a person I want to work with, here's a person I want to work side by side with every day, that's something you have to take really seriously. But at the same time, you can't compromise on your values. You have to be true, you have to be brutally honest about where your company is right now, what the needs are, and what this candidate potentially has to offer. There's a lot of desire, especially again in tight markets, to say, it's not a perfect fit, he's not the great long-term hire, or she's not the great long-term hire, but we need somebody today. I would say resist that, wait till you find somebody that really complements the team where it is today. Because on a team of five or 10, Adding one more person really changes the dynamic of that team and the culture of that team. Timing is important. And I don't just mean the like, how much notice do you have to give before you can start kind of timing. I mean organizational timing. Again, there are people out there that are really good that I would love to hire or would have loved to hire in our first year at CodeGuard, but they need more of the big company support system around them to be successful. They need dedicated QA. They need somebody else that they're taking out the trash. They don't want to talk to customers, so they've done that enough. Um, so there are people that might have perfect engineering skills, but you don't have the organization to support them yet. And you need to be honest about that. And <laughs> to, to stay on brand here, talk to a lot of people. There's no substitute for getting out in the community, which is why I have all these uh, pictures on the slide here. We have this you know, embarrassment of riches here in the Atlanta community of people that are willing to help and want to help and organizations where people can get together. And with that, I'll throw my hat into the ring. 
you know, I'm in a fortunate place where I have the opportunity and time to help. And if anybody out there needs a hand, wants to talk, has ideas, I'd love to talk to them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was great. CBQ, questions? Jonathan, thanks for the talk. You said, I liked it, you said, customer success should be an engineering discipline. Yep. Can you give an ex a good example of CodeGuard of how you did that or so something you do to make sure, because you gave it an example even when you said you were recruiting, like yeah. that it can be hard to recruit people, engineers who really care. Right. So we actually at CodeGuard, in the early days, we got away from you know calling it support. We called it product development feedback or PDF. We discovered that in the market we were going into, there were a ton of edge cases that weren't immediately obvious. You know, CodeGuard, we do website backups, so we're dealing with people that are potentially hosted here in the US to people that are using free hosting in Eastern Europe. And you know, we didn't have the, the forethought or the presence of mind to do that testing of you know, free hosting providers in Eastern Europe that are basically operating on an old 56K modem. But it was customers that tried it that then had issues. So we took in all of this information that were coming in from customers as feedback for the product. And we didn't, our, our goal was not to just make it work for them and run away, but it was to improve the product or tell them no, that we can't service them or something like that. And still to this day, we have engineering team members that work on the front lines of support that are answering questions for customers. See, I did it. They're working on the front lines of customer service where, uh, you know, that are answering the phones, that are you know, doing the chat, that are talking to customers. Uh, great presentation. Uh, to, to build on what he just said with regards to customer success, could you delve in a little bit more on like uh, customer success segmentation? Like there's some customers that are profitable. There's some customers that help you with guidance towards the market of how, you, how fast you should go with timing. Could you delve into that a little bit? Sure. Um, my recommendation would be potentially to treat everybody the same, whether they're paying you a thousand dollars a month or a dollar a month. Um, depending on how your product is structured and what the tiers look like for the different levels of service, we see a lot of people come in that are, you know, paying us five dollars a month, and then six months later they're paying us a thousand dollars a month because they come in at the lowest tier because it's low risk. They can get, you know, they can try it out, kick the tires, and then they start moving up. So whether, especially with the first run experience, you want it to be good. So I would say treat everybody the same to the extent that you can. So you talked about automating um, early. Uh, how early is early in automation? Because DevOps is a technical debt that is difficult to pay in the very early stages of application development or creating a piece of software. So how early did y'all start uh, implementing Kubernetes or something like that? Yeah, I mean, not early enough, which is why I wanted to mention it here. Um, I think if you're asking the question, it's time to start seriously considering it. Um, but I think realistically, it depends on where you see the team going and what the needs of the product are. If you need to deploy 10 times a day, or if you need to deploy once a day, there's going to be a different you know, weight to how much time you should invest in automating one thing versus the other. But with onboarding, you can kind of see that coming. You can see like, OK, we're going to be you know, hiring here, we want to hire five people. This time next year, we want to double our size. You definitely need to put the things in place earlier than that happens to make your lives easier. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that you get customers to start from $6 a month coming in at your lowest tier. Uh, how do you upgrade them as far as uh, what, do you, what strategies do you use to get them to continue to go up your value ladder? That's a good question. I mean, for us, we, um, we charge per website. So people come in at the lowest tier with one website to try it out. But those people that are coming in to try it out, maybe it's an agency with 100 websites. So they can self-select as they go up the ladder. Um, in terms of how to do it, I think there's a lot, a lot more intelligent people out there than I that uh, have written on this. Um, but things like feature gating and you know, restricting the levels of uh, you know, functionality and features you get to, to push people up the, the ladder. We've grown a lot the, through channel and word of mouth, so not a ton of email marketing. Um, you know, we've been able to partner with some really big hosting providers that you know take care of the marketing for us. They're bringing us their customers because we're a value, you know, we're a value-added feature for them. Um, for the agencies, for the smaller hosting providers, it's all been word of mouth. You know, we tried to build a really good product, and that takes time, but it pays off. Cool. <clears throat> 
let, let's say you're, you need an engineer that's uh, ideally right attitude, right experience, solidity programmer. Mm -hmm. But there's nobody out there, or they've all gone to the West Coast, so they're too expensive. So what are the criteria to use to hire somebody who you have confidence they can ramp up on the language they've never touched before? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and actually, there's a slide in here that I cut for time. So let's, let's bust that out. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different kind of archetypes that you can find in, uh, when you're looking to, to hire. Um, and I think it really depends on where your product is in its life cycle, how supportive other people are around it, and how much time you really have. Um, there are people that can get up to speed really fast on any language, but they really have to be able to dig deep into it. So even if you have an existing code base that people can jump in and start working on, where there's already defined patterns, where there's support from the team, you know, who are experts, um, that is a way to, to get somebody up to speed quickly. The other way is, I mean, I, I like people that have a lot of side projects because it shows that they're interested in other things, they're curious, they've built up the muscle of learning new things and implementing new things. So that's another good litmus test for engineering in general, but especially for being able to get somebody up to speed quickly, whether it's a language or a framework or you know, particular domain expertise. <laughs> I am definitely the generalist. I, I like doing a lot of things, um, but I don't have a, a singular, you know, like the whiz, the, this kind of singular focus and passion. Okay. Uh, have you hired some contractors or were all employees? And how you manage the risk and the quality of the product? Yeah, that's a great question. And also another slide that I have. Um, <laughs> So this is, uh, this is, these are the number of full-time employees relative to contractors that we've had at CodeGuard since 2011. And this is basically like kind of high watermarks on an annual basis. Um, managing the risk is challenging. You've got to do all of that up front by finding somebody that you trust. Um, if you can get somebody that can come on site and work side by side, that's a good way to manage risk if you're seeing them every day versus if they're you know, in another country. But we've had great success working with people in other countries. Um, in terms of onboarding, a lot of the automation goes a long way to that because they don't have to ask a lot of questions, they don't have to read a bunch of documentation, they can just you know, kind of fire it up and go. Um, for contractors, it kind of depends on what your needs are. If you have a specific need that, you know, for example, uh, you know, user experience, if you have one page and you need somebody to come in and redesign, you can find ways to get them into just that area quickly versus if you need somebody that's gonna be full stack developer, then you have to widen your search a little bit to somebody that you can work with, you can communicate well with, that's going to be part of the team for an extended period. So I don't know if that answers your question. Let's give Jonathan a round of hand. A round of applause. Give him a hand. Thanks. Christine Kajubski is the Chief People Officer at Sales Loft. And for those who haven't been in the Sales Loft office, there is a vibe and energy that is very electric. You walk in and things are getting done. And she is now the protector of that culture. So that's very exciting. Before Sales Loft, she worked at Commissions Inc., which is a fantastic success story in Atlanta. Um, more of a, uh, a, silent, a silent killer, but very successful. And even before then, she worked at Dunkin' Brands, formerly Dunkin' Donuts. Love that coffee. It uh, takes me about two hours to finish it. And today she's gonna be talking about the, the value-based approach that SalesLoft has and how she, with SalesLoft, is focused on hiring, retaining, and building one of the best and diverse cultures in Atlanta. And when she's not working, she's raising two daughters and also focused on women and technology organizations and leadership. So let's give a big round of, a hand, round of applause to Christine. Thank you. I, uh, I do have two daughters. I have loved the videos um, that Brad and Jeff showed earlier today. Uh, my daughter's just a scotch older. Uh, they're 14 and 18, and they're also on fall break right now. So if I was to show a video, they'd be napping. 
um, which would probably not be applicable to today's conversation. Um, so thank you so much. I, as uh, we kind of teed up, I've had a very lucky, diverse background. Um, I started my career at Ford Motor, Ford Motor Company. Anybody else from Michigan here? OK, well, then I will be able to tell my joke. OK, so the joke is, is that they don't let you out of the state until you work for one of the big three. And so I checked that box, uh, went through the automotive downturn. After that, I did. I worked for Duncan Brands, was with Duncan Brands when we went IPO. It was an exciting time. It was great. Um, and then through all that growth, I uh, was able to work at three startups, Sales Loft being my most current uh, place that I'm at, and I love it. Um, and these organizations have been anywhere from 150 to 1,500 employees. So lots of growth. There's one constant through all of these organizations, large, small, fast growth, a little bit more historical, and that is people. And the thing is, is that there is nothing that is more important to your success than hiring great people. And the thing about it is that Jonathan teed up, which I couldn't have asked for anything better that was so great. Hiring is hard. It's a big challenge, in particular when you are at this growth phase. And the thing that's even harder is hiring great people. Hiring great people is brutally hard. And yet when you think about your success, and how these individuals will contribute to your business, there is absolutely nothing more important to success than having those right people on your team. So when you think about hiring, why? Why is it so hard? You're like, OK, so I just find a person. They have a skill set. That's great. They want to come work for our company. Awesome. Well, part of that challenge is the fact that we're focusing on skill set. When in reality, it's all about fit. And I know that probably in conversations that you've had with other people, they're like, gosh, you know, I really, really like this person, but it's just, yeah, they're just not the right fit. Fit is a legitimate term when we think about individuals within our organization. And what makes fit so important is not just the core competencies that somebody has in order to accomplish the work that you want them to do, it's about how do they relate and how do they personally connect with not just the skill set, but also the core values. Do their core values meet what you need in your organization of your core values? Now, I want to tell you a little story that just because you lead people operations does not mean you always get it right, OK? Um, so about four years ago, um, I had previously, in a previous job at, my, at Duncan, I'd been traveling a lot. Um, and as I mentioned, I had two daughters that are teenagers, and I decided I wanted to get off the road warrior thing, and I was going to go work at an organization. Um, had an opportunity to start an HR team there, which was exciting. The only challenge was, was that I was traveling from the west side of Marietta to the east side of Johns Creek. So for those of you outside of the Atlanta area, it was a wonderful about hour and 45 minute commute each way. It was great. So. <laughs> So I had this genius idea. I was like, I am going to hire an au pair. This is going to be great. So we did the video interviews, and I think made sure that you know, they were CPR certified and could drive in the United States, and the girls liked this individual. It's perfect. It's going to be life changing. So my au pair comes over. Her name's Annika. It's great. Within the first couple of weeks, I was like, mm, there's a problem. What I valued in my home was, you know, I wanted to make sure that somebody was care and taking care of my girls, and really, I, I value high sense of achievement and drive. Annika's intention was a little bit more. She valued like the experience and you know going out with other au pairs, and so I was like, okay, well that definitely was not the right fit. So sometimes you don't always get it right. But when we think about what was important to me and to my family. First, what was important to Annika at that time was a sense of a lack of, of connection on these values. So let's unpack core values here for a minute. Really, what is core values, right? So core values truly, it's the fundamental beliefs. It's your foundation of what defines you as a person or as an organization. And when you apply your core values correctly, 
They help you understand that you are on that right path. You are on the road to success. What I love here is we say it's an unwavering guide. If you use your core values through, as a filter through every single decision that you make, you cannot make a wrong decision for your business. And that includes hiring. So how does that show up in the hiring process? When we think about a traditional hiring process, Sales Loft does these three steps. We create a performance, pro a performance profile and a job description. So you have to define what you're looking for in order to find it, right? Next step, very traditional. We go through a recruiter screen. That person then weeds out the B and C players. A players get passed along to the hiring manager. They do a hiring manager screen. Pretty traditional. But where Sales Loft takes the next step is all these steps. The next step after that is a top grade interview. Top grade, I am the biggest fan of this process. Um, and it was something new that I experienced coming to Sales Loft. It's a chronological review, usually, usually starting at the college years, going through all of your career progression with a candidate that helps you understand the decisions that they made, why they made those decisions, what were the goals they had, and did they accomplish those goals. Mine lasted two and a half hours. Um, they're usually not that long. I just have a little bit more tenure in the career department. Then we have a peer interview. That's where other members of the work group, the functional group that this person will be working with, will be able to talk to that candidate. And then that candidate will also be able to talk to people that they will be working alongside with. Then we go through a core values interview. This is where we talk to the candidate specifically with questions that are geared to determine their fit against our five core values. Then we do reference interviews, where the hiring manager calls all the references, not the recruiter, to get firsthand knowledge of what this person is communicating about this candidate that, that was referred to us. And then if they manage people or are a leader, then they also speak with one of our founders. So it's been said, sales loft, we don't have the shortest interview process. But I can say that it is a key uh, definer for who we are. And what I'd like to do is unpack this core values interview process in a little bit more detail. So when we talk about core values, what this is not is for these core value interviewers to determine fit for the role. What it is is to everything about culture fit. So, the team setup to begin with is crucial. We have 10 sets of core value interviewers on a team of two, one male, one female. They are anywhere from about two years of tenure plus, or, and then the other member is about six months tenure plus. They have to be nominated. They are interviewed by myself and one of our founders, Kyle or Rob. And then they have to go through training. So being a member of the core value interview team at Sales Loft is a big deal. From there, they get training on all of the questions that we have already created that tie back to each one of our core values. As an example, one of our core values is glass half full. This does not mean I am positive all the time. It does not mean that I am just a generally happy person. It means that I am going to approach things in a positive manner. And when things get hard, because they will, I'm going to take a lesson from that. And how do I positively apply that to the next thing? So we ask questions such as, what was the biggest challenge that you overcame? And how, do, how did you approach it? We ask questions about, when you were with a team member and they were negative, how did you approach that? These are real life examples. We also have things that go to bias towards action, right? So we want to be action oriented. We want to be making sure that we are moving forward, sometimes even if we don't have all of the data points figured out. So when you were on a project, talk to me about a time that you were the leader and then you were the follower and how did those work differently for you? When you wanted to have a goal, what were the steps that you took in order to achieve that goal, personal or professional? All of these things can help us understand where do they connect and how is that fit? 
for the candidate and the organization. And then lastly, with our core value interview team, the decision must be unanimous. So both members of that team must agree that yes, we feel that this person is a fit, or no, they are not. And if they are not, they don't move forward. So how do we know that this is working? One key is, is that we get great feedback from our candidates. So any candidate that comes on site for an interview, even if they're not extended an offer of a job, gets sent a survey. Candidate experience is just the same as your customer experience. It's important. I want everybody to be feeling very positive when they leave. The things that they tell us is that I felt such a great connection to your organization. I got to know a little bit more about what I'd be walking into. And it drives their desire to work at Sales Loft even higher. And in this tough hiring environment, that can't be any more important to their selection process because they've got offers. The, part, the second part is, is that it's become part of who we are. No one is exempt. I went through a core values interviewing process. Every single other leader and employee that comes to Sales Loft goes through this step. Why is this important? Because this way, every single employee that works at Sales Loft knows that every leader that they work with, they work alongside with, they see as other leaders of the other departments has gone through that exact same experience. They know that they all fit our core values. The other piece is that it helps new employees ramp up quickly. When we talked about that connection early on, even in the interview process, when they come on their first day, I meet with every single new hire. We talk about the core values interview process. We talk about how they related to it, what their feedback was. And I give them the rally cry that they then should be held themselves and everybody else accountable in Sales Loft to our core values. Not 90 days from now, starting today. They are core values champion. It also contributes to our low turnover rate because we know that there's that high level of fit within the organization because they personally connect with our core values. And most importantly to me, it helps our culture remain as we scale. So today we are at 309 employees. 50% of our organization has been at Sales Loft less than a year. All of our employees have gone through this, this process and our culture has remained. Something I'm exceptionally proud of. So I'm going to go back to this beginning. There's nothing more important to your company's success than hiring great people. And what I love is that I know that everybody in this room has an opportunity to hire somebody that is this amazing fit. And you will make a difference in these people's lives. And to me, there is no greater success than that. Thank you. Fantastic. So in a, in a fast growth company like Sales Loft, with that extensive of an interview process, I, there has to be pressure put against it. Like, we need to hire now. We're onboarding all these customers. We're short staffed. How are you? You were there with yesterday. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. How are you able to maintain the integrity of the interview process, yet also move with enough speed to actually, you know, solve the business need? It's great business partnership. So everybody, including my high, especially my hiring managers, believes in this process. We don't shortcut the process, even though I know that we have you know, 59 current openings. I personally have five on my team. And we know how important the process is because of all the results that we talked about, the impact that it's making. Therefore, they're committed to quickly moving the process along and understand that means that we have to make flexibility in schedules. That means that we know that when somebody comes on site, that's going to be a three hour block that we need to uh, fit other people into that for the different phases that goes through when they come on site. Um, and sometimes it involves a little bit of juggling, but it's the commitment of the hiring managers that makes it possible. Mm -hmm. Do you find in the job market here right now that um, you have to skip steps in the process to, so you don't lose good candidates. Like I, we, I've lost 
um, on a recent hire. I lost two really good candidates just because we, we were trying to be more deliberate and we, we just weren't moving fast enough. Do you have the same issue? And you know, if you find someone on the first interview that's awesome, would you skip a step or would you skip multiple steps? I would not. I, I am wholly committed to the results that this process has shown. And you're right. We do lose some candidates because our process is long. But what helps with that is that we fully communicate to our candidates on the very upfront that says, this is exactly what you can expect if you go through our entire process. Um, we, we don't want it to be shy about the time and the commitment that that takes. Um, and the other thing that I've seen, um, in particularly recently with the challenging talent market here, is that when they know the entire process and then they come in early and they get so excited, um, there is there is this buzz that you just get coming into sales loft, and I love it so much. They're willing and able to make the accommodation to go through the entire process because they're committed to wanting to work there. Hi. Um, Hi. So I work with a lot of early stage companies. Um, they're five, 10, 15 employees max. Um, and many of them don't have their core values defined. Many of them hardly even know what the hiring process should even look like. What do you recommend to companies that are just getting started? Uh, they know core values and culture is so important, but they struggle with defining it. Yeah, there are a lot of great processes out there that you can utilize in order to define your core values. Um, there's actually an article in this month's Psychology Today um, that you can use in order to define your own personal core values. Um, my lucky girls and I, was we were on vacation, I'm like, oh, girls, we're going to do this because this is what it's like to live with me. And so, um, uh, so you can utilize that same process as an organization as well. Um, but you can, I cannot emphasize enough that it is never too early to define your core values. It, again, what is the definition of core values? It is the foundation on what you build upon. And having that strong foundation early um, helps to generate uh, greater success because you're able to define fit earlier on. Yes. Um, I guess where in your process do uh, technical interview questions or, um, you know, how do you know if they can really do the work or do you even do it at all because it sounds like there's a lot of culture talk. And I mean, I would almost like a candidate to say, you know, I can do this, but I can't do it in two minutes while you're watching me. Correct. Uh, right. So we have a lot of different. How do you all handle that? Yeah, we do. We do a lot of different assessments. Um, we have an engineering coding assessment um, that an individual will be assigned, and then it's up to them about how long it takes them in order to return it. We have a sales assessment, um, which is also part of it is a cognitive test, and then it is a um, and that happens. In, excuse me. It's a cognitive test, and then it's also a sales example. So they do a demo. Um, those happen after the hiring manager screen before they come on site. So you do job posting, recruiter screen, hiring manager screen. You weeded out your B and C players. Now you've got your group of A players. Usually that's when they get an assessment, if that team needs an assessment. And then with that, they come back on site. I'm going to make sure that answered your question. OK, great, perfect. Mm -hmm. Uh, love the sales love core values. What what core value do you wish more startups had these days? Ooh, that's a great question. I'll let you steal uh, sales loves more of sales loves. Okay, well thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the one that more startups could apply is the bias towards action. And what I mean by that is that we're constantly focusing on results. That's a, one that we can all relate to. Um, but I remember when I interviewed and I was having a conversation with Rob Foreman and he was, we were talking about core values and then I got into a great conversation with Kyle and we were debating back and forth about all these core values and he's like, what if you had to take one away from your current company? I'm like, I wouldn't, it's who it defines us. Um, they were talking about how passionate they were around the bias towards action because you move so fast and there's so much change and there's sometimes a variable that we're just not aware of that cannot prevent you from moving forward. And that's what I love about it. Um, so great presentation. Uh, I have magic with Unbox. Um, so one thing I really love about your eight step process is that not only are you accounting for like the corporate culture, but you're not overlooking the subcultures within the organization. 
uh, which I think a lot of companies do overlook. Um, so my question is that have you found any assessment tools or any tools out there that can help maybe not only accelerate but not lose the effectiveness of your guys' core values and making sure that this person is not only a great fit for the organization, then a great fit for the team as well? Yeah, I think that the assessment tools that we are using help to assess skill set, um, but we rely on our own internal employees in order to evaluate uh, core values or culture fit. Um, and going through that very deliberate process about building out that core value interview team, um, the training, the interviewing, the assessing, um, the practice that goes along with it, the dynamics of the team, a little bit more tenured, new, male and female, all of that mix is what I, we have found is the best applicable use of our internal talent in order to evaluate core values. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you talked a lot about the acquisition side of uh, your team or people, but what about the evaluation side of your existing body of uh, employees? And then secondary, you talked about part of the hiring process is to identify people within the organization that can evaluate these other people that are coming in. And you said male versus female, there, there's a, a split there. But what about the, um, the, the diverse uh, nature of your actual team? So how, how do you start identifying um, the other people that need to be able to have uh, input into this so that you can have an actual diverse or inclusive team? Great. Can you clarify a little bit more about the current evaluation of the of the current team? What is in particular? Because that could go out a different a bunch well, of different ways. To a certain extent, I think you talked about there's um, there's segmentation inside your uh, your company. You've got marketing teams. You probably got pods that you delegate different tasks or different feature sets to. And so, how do you continually evaluate their skill sets that they are up to the up to the task every single day to do the job that is uh, relative to the position that you're in as a company? Moving that you know fast paced and, and growing so, uh, uh, I guess, so, so quickly? Yeah, I, I'm gonna answer it this way, but you tell me this is not what you're looking for. Um, we do a lot and we value highly in the moment feedback. Um, so we don't have a formalized annual review process. Um, so we don't wait one year or anything along those lines. We do quarterly reviews and check-ins. Um, in addition to that, um, we do a quarterly OKR process um, that helps to evaluate what is most important for us to accomplish in that quarter, and then therefore, we're constantly having a pressure test and a review against how we're trending against what we have already identified are our goals. So, yeah, okay. Um, and then you had your secondary question? Yeah, we focus a lot on diversity and inclusion within Sales Loft. And for that, we do a lot of training. We have a lot of conversations. We do things such as unbiased uh, recruiting training. We do a lot of conversations that talks about what is inclusivity. Um, so you have diversity, which is how you bring people of different backgrounds, thought process, all that onto your team. But inclusiveness is really about how does everybody feel like and bring their best genuine self to work every single day. And so we holistically and organically have a lot of those conversations so that those individuals that are part of the peer evaluation or the core values evaluation, that kind of got that already ingrained into them um, in addition to the other additional training that we provide. Mm -hmm. Can I throw out a, a, an op, another approach, untested? Get sure. your point. Why not just simplify it and say there are certifications and their assessments that the performance of which will reflect uh, skill levels, you take the top five performing people, the, the hiring manager who's going to be responsible for their performance interviews them, he, makes a, he or she makes a decision, that's who they hire, the hiring manager is responsible for the performance of the people they hire, and leave everybody else out of the equation. I don't think that, that would be mirroring what our culture is, which is a very inclusive culture. Um, and I would say that we had, we had somebody that would pressure tested doing an assessment first, even before a recruiter screen in an interview. My pushback to that is, is that when you can have a recruiter that is, they, they are front lines, man. My recruiters are the ambassadors of sales loft to all candidates. And I want them to be able to understand and connect with a candidate um, prior to them just sending a, a, an assessment cold where they don't understand the value and the wonderful place that sales loft is to work. Um, that's my personal approach. I know that companies do that, and, and that may be what works best for them. Um, that's just not how I choose to do it, um, because I want to have that personal connection. 
And then because of the layers of the peer interview, the top grade, the, uh, the core value interview, and then if you need to interview with a founder, it does. That takes a lot of time. But I also think that the win of that is a connection from the very first day. There's a lot lower turnover. Um, we, we run about a third that of industry average. Um, and that results in higher productivity and higher levels of success. We've got one more. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. Very valuable. Uh, my question is very quick. What position do you guys hire for the most? Um, people operations. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, right now, we're hiring most engineers and prod dev. What about the sales team? How often do you guys hire for sales? We are always hiring for sales as well. Um, because of the growth, um, we have a lot of internal promotion as well. And so a lot of those positions open up. Um, but if you're asking me today, pulse check, what do I have the most need for? It's engineering and project, project dev. Let's give Christine one more round of applause. Thank you, Thank you so much. We'll start off with the interviewer, David Cummings, CEO of Atlanta Ventures, founder of the Atlanta Tech Village, and kind of everything what you see around here is because of David. Not really kind of, it is. <laughs> so let's give David a round of applause. And he is interviewing Josh Pigford. Josh is the CEO of Bear Metrics. Bear Metrics is a fantastic business that Josh has um, built in Alabama, Birmingham. And the thing I love about what Josh does is he's very transparent with his writing. He's uh, very vulnerable, even on Twitter. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And Bear Metrics, they bear their metrics as well. Um, they provide revenue analytics and insights to businesses of all sizes. Um, and 15 years in, he's still winging it. <laughs> Fun factoid before we get started, he once built and ran the most popular social network for pug owners. So let's make sure we get into that too. Let's give Josh a round of applause. All right. All right, Josh, my favorite opening question. How did you get started as an entrepreneur? Uh, I would say I started when I was like five or something. I mean, like I, I'm probably the classic sort of kid who, you know, cuts grass and like make signs and sets them up in the yard and mm -hmm. like tries to make money. Um, so I've been doing that since I was a kid, really. And uh, so it was just it was just there. I don't. It know. wasn't like mom it's, or dad saying, no, "Hey, go so, make some money." You know, like dad's an engineer, like had the same job for thirty years, kind of guy, mm -hmm. like. Uh, my mom plans weddings. Like, I, you know, no uh, entrepreneurial bones in any anybody's body related mm -hmm. to me. So I don't know what, I think um, past being an entrepreneur probably more than anything is I, like, I'm a maker. Like, I want to make stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, like, that veers more towards, like, I want to make money. But, like... It's also, uh, I, I, I enjoy building up something. And so, you know, making a thing and selling it, like, it just sort of gets, you know, it makes me excited. So, uh, and that's always been the case. So you went to school in Mississippi, live Correct. in Alabama now. Yep. What was that process? How did you arrive in Birmingham? So I um, went to school in Mississippi, graduated. Then my wife and I got married and moved out to Denver, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and then we ended up, moving back to Birmingham when we had our first kid. So it's like all our families down south, but mm -hmm. you know, sort of geographically, it's all sort of indifferent for me. But you know, Birmingham's where we've been for the past seven, eight years. So, so on your pinned tweet on Twitter, yeah. you have this amazing spreadsheet of dozens and dozens of businesses you've started. Yep. Some are projects, some are businesses. Yep. Some sold for $1,000 as yeah. their exit valuation. For, for the Pug website. For the yeah. Pug website. Yeah. Yeah. Some sold for more money than that. It's right. really fascinating. Yeah. So check out Josh on Twitter. Go to his pinned tweet, and you'll see a, a Google sheet of all these companies he started. Plus. It's kind of it's pathetic on some level. But. So he started over 50 different companies. Yeah. Some of them on there are, um, shall we say, uh, out there in terms of ideas. Right. 
And then some are more down the middle, SaaS type ideas. Take us through the most uh, exotic or unusual sure. one, and sort of what was the genesis of that? Yeah, so I, um, so the very first thing that I ever started that I would like from an internet-based business um, was uh, I was teaching myself to program, and I wanted to build a. This is this is like a early two thousands, so I wanted to have a way to um, like share all of the random things that I found on the internet. So this, that was uh, reallydumbstuff.com was the, was the first one, followed shortly thereafter by reallyfunarcade.com, right? So <laughs> these are the kind of things that like, I started with, right? And, but then it, like, you know, over the course of 10 years, it was like there was this mix of me trying to start things, um, you know, but then a lot of it's just like me, like I, there was this one thing, one time frame where I got really obsessed with like Amazon affiliate stuff or just affiliate marketing in general, which was not my bag, and I uh, hated it. So I figured that out, that I didn't like doing that stuff. Um, but then, like, slowly what you see through the spreadsheet from, like, starting back in the early 2000s to now is, like, I start figuring out what could be legitimate businesses. So, you know, I, I um, decided to, like, dabble in e-commerce. And so, like, my wife and I started um, a collectible, like, a toy company, essentially. And we're, like... We were like in our apartment with vinyl toys stacked to the ceiling, you know, going to bed at night, like with like high on plastic fumes. And um, so, you know, I, I start dabbling into that, and that leads into other things like actually getting into more traditional sort of SaaS stuff. And um, to me, that's the most interesting part is like watching this transition from like, you know, the, the first thing legitimately was dumb. I mean, like, that was the name of it, right? Like, <laughs> so, and, and, and it just, but it, I like to think it improved over time. You see the frequency decrease, and in theory, the quality increasing. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I guess, that's up for debate, but, yeah. So, self-taught programmer. Yes. Graphic design in college. Correct. Jack of all trades. Yeah, and very much the master of none of it. Like, I, um... I like being in that sort of generalist category. I think it serves me really well for starting things. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it uh, is a negative um, when it comes to like having to like stick with something for a long time, as is like shown by a spreadsheet of 50 plus projects over mm -hmm. the past. And so one of the strengths, if you check out the Bear Metrics blog, is content marketing. Some amazing content. Tell us the backstory. How did you sort of come upon content marketing and what were some of the lessons learned over time? Yeah, so um, prior to Bear Metrics, I had um, sort of a survey software company. Um, you, know, you think of like SurveyMonkey, that kind of genre. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this was 2010, 11, somewhere around there. Um, and I feel like content marketing had become a thing that people knew could work but they hadn't figured out how to do it right. So there was lots of um, just pump out as much content that content as you can. So when I was doing the survey startup, uh, I went that route of like, pay somebody 15, 20 bucks to pump out a 500 word article, call it a day, you've produced 1,000 articles, good for you. Mm -hmm. None of it does anything for you. And you've wasted your time, and then you kind of write off like, ah, oh, content marketing didn't work for us. Mm -hmm. So when I moved in, when I started Bear Metrics, I decided like, uh, oh, and that's one other thing. I also, um, I, I ran a company, so it was called The Apple Blog, got acquired by a larger tech publication, but it was around just producing content. So like, I was very comfortable with the process of producing content. Mm -hmm. So when Bear Metrics got started, um, I had been building stuff for long enough where one, I knew that, um, so I, I had an experience with content enough for it to, for me to know that um, it could work, but at the same time, I knew what not to do from like the previous company, mm -hmm. where it's like we can't do the like 500 word generic article thing that anybody could have written. Um, so I also, at the same time, wanted to. I decided to like specifically be try to be helpful with the content, um, and not just from a teaching perspective, but like from a what's working and what's not working. Because I had spent the prior, you know, almost decade just sort of like trying random things and hoping it would work. And a lot of stuff didn't. And I wish somebody would have told me things that could potentially 
not work or work or whatever. So that's, that became the focus, was for me just to like write stuff that I was trying as we were growing the company. So is there a certain tone or voice or style that you have in your writing that you think helps resonate with your audience? Yeah, I, if, so for me, I was telling you back there, like writing on the blog is startup therapy for me. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's a way for me, a lot of stuff that I'm writing is not from a place of, hey, I've done a thing that works really well, here's how I did it, here's how you could do it. It's more of, I don't really know what I'm doing, but here's how I've been trying to work it out over the past, you know, days, weeks, and months. Mm -hmm. And so that ends up resonating a lot with other founders who also don't know what they're doing, you know, just like me, right? So um, it's a way to sort of, the tone is, is um, from a place of like, hey, we're all kind of winging it, so here's some things that have been working or have failed miserably. Mm -hmm. And so just like throwing it all out there is kind of the tone, I guess. So tell us the or origination story for Bear Metrics. Yep. So um, in 2000, uh, yeah, 10, 11, 12, 13, I was running the survey company. Um, and at the time, there, the whole concept of like SaaS metrics, so monthly recurring revenue, lifetime value, churn, like the, the metrics that a lot of times are very specifically associated with um, the sort of SaaS business model. Mm -hmm. um, Getting that stuff at the time was v very difficult. You know, it was lots of either manually doing stuff in spreadsheets. Um, you know, you might connect to some data warehouse kind of thing, but you have to, or, or some big sort of analytics product, and you're paying lots and lots of money to get that. Um, and so, at the at the same time, so there's a company called Stripe who does like payment processing mm -hmm. stuff, was really starting to take off. We happen to be using. Stripe, and so I started looking like, hey, can I just pull the data from Stripe, build my own analytics product, and it was initially just this internal tool, like I had no intention of doing anything with it, um, and then as I started building it and talking to some other founder friends, um, realized like, hey, there is a need for it, because everybody's doing this thing in a spreadsheet that they hate and they never update, and it's sort of ripe for getting it wrong, because you there's a typo or something or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the less time you have to spend on a spreadsheet, the better. So, um, so I decided to build this thing, just threw it out there, didn't really think anything of it. I mean, like, literally had built it internally and then decided to put it out there on a whim, threw a pricing page up with sort of arbitrarily picked pricing um, plans, and then it just sort of took off from there pretty quick. So that was 2013. So was there a, a blog post or a, a content marketing piece that really kicked it off, or is it just yeah. slow and steady so early what, on? So what kicked it off was, were two things. So about three, about three, three or four months after um, I had launched it, this, it was just me. I did 100% of everything, design. Solo entrepreneur. Yes, and, and literally I had nobody else doing anything on it. For the first you designed the website, design, you wrote the code, you built, built it, the product. Cut all the uh, customer support, any kind of you know marketing or what I mean, whatever. I was the mm -hmm. only guy doing it. So um, I decided in um, so I launched it in like uh, October, I think, or November. And then that February, I was um, thinking like, okay, it would be really helpful to have a demo of this analytics product. So mm -hmm. like, what I could fake all this data, or I could just make it public. Like I just make the whole dashboard public for everybody. The dashboard of your own company's the, right. financial so, data, so here's your own company's making, everything. Here's you know, how bad, say, churn is. Like Here's all the people who canceled, whatever. So we, we anonymized the actual company names. Mm -hmm. um, I say we, me, I, anonymized. But you basically went to the world and said, I have a business. Right. It's making very little money. Lots yeah. of customers are leaving me. But this is reality. But These are my actual real numbers. Right. Here's. Here's how your business could look failing. <laughs> uh, so, um, but so it started from a place of um, I I say like laziness more than anything. But um, at the same time, I wanted I guess there was a small like, altruistic component to it in that you know I've been doing this for many years and there's been there have been lots of people who have helped me and answered all these questions and been open um, with a lot of this kind of information just to help me. So here's a way that I can maybe um, remove a little bit of the facade of, hey, you know, because you, you talk to anybody, 
how's, how's, how's it going? Like, how's the startup doing? How's your business doing? Like, oh, we're killing it. Like, no, <laughs> statistically, you're not. You're probably doing terrible. But um, you know, here we'll, like, we can talk about it now. Here's the central thing that can be this point for us to talk about. So that's where that started from. And when that happened, well, that sort of generates some buzz. And then from there, a couple of other companies said, hey, we want to make our numbers public too, amazingly. And then it just sort of took off from there. But so roughly how many companies publish so their metrics to the world? So now there's probably, I think, close to two dozen that have said, here's our, how our company's doing, mm -hmm. good or bad, you know, and you can see them and follow, follow along. So. so is there a point where it felt more like a side hustle and then it crossed some sort of chasm and you're like, hey, this is going to be yes. the real deal? And what was that point? So that point was when I could, um, I mean, so for me, I'm very um, pragmatic. And so when it got to the point where I could make a full-time salary off of it, it was like, Okay, cool. We're good. We'll keep doing this and not the other things. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, but then, it, and I did not ever expect for it to do much past. Maybe I could, uh, you know, initially it was like, hey, here's a side project. I've got the survey thing. That's fine. And I'll do this bare metrics things for kicks. Eventually, so I mentioned Stripe was who it was initially built on. Eventually, like, they'll probably have their own thing. And then bare metrics will go away. It'll be fine. Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and but then it just, it just kept growing, and so I decided, well, we'll just stick with this and see what happens, and stuck with it. So so it goes from side hustle to main hustle. Yes. Yeah. You're the solo entrepreneur. When right. did you make that first hire? hire. Uh, when I when stuff started breaking and I couldn't fix it, like that was a good point to hire. So uh, first hire was a it was an engineer. Um, who I had met basically like at a networking event kind of thing. And um, we had happened to sit by each other at lunch at the networking thing. And uh, I, so I, I tweet too much. And I, had, <laughs> I was tweeting essentially like this whole thing just melting down, the, the servers and all that stuff. And so he happened to message me and was like, hey man, do you want some help? Yeah. So um, so he helps, and then I end up just, I end up hiring, and you know worked for three years I think. So uh, he was yeah he was the first hire, and that was I wish I had hired him a lot earlier, which is kind of the story of my life. But um, yeah, engineer was the first hire. So the business is over a million dollars of recurring revenue. You can see it on the website yes. as part of the bare metrics. Yeah. And so you've gone from being the side hustle to the main hustle right. to the first employee to seven or eight employees today. Right. Talk to us a little bit about where the employees are located and what the environment is like. Yes, so we're a completely remote company. I happen to be in Birmingham, but nobody else is. Uh, we're, you know, I've got a few people in Europe, a few other people sprinkled around the US. Um, and I, early on, it was sort of a conscious decision to hire remotely. Um, not because I had had trouble like, oh, I really want to hire from Birmingham and I just can't find anybody. But it was more of a, I, Growing up as, you know, a kid on the internet, like, that the internet was a location for me as much as any sort of city was. Mm. So it was, a, I had spent, you know, I was a kid in high school who was, like, find, like finding random people on the internet who, like, we would build stuff to get, like, just some guy on a message board, like, hey, you want to make this thing? Sure, why not? Whatever. And so that was a very easy sort of, it translates very easy for me where, um, I think like, okay, I want to hire for some role. What, who cares where they are? Uh, I'm perfectly capable and comfortable communicating with them over the internet because I've spent the past 10, 15, 20 years doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, so whenever we ha you know, have a job opening, it's post it, and I will happily talk to anybody from anywhere. And if we can make it work, then cool, it'll work. And so from the beginning, it was always, yeah, let's just hire the best that we can get. Um, and regardless of you know, their location. And so how do you balance being a doer type, a maker type, right. but now you've got your CEO hat on, you've yeah. got eight employees. Yeah. What's that, what's that like? Yeah, so it's not my favorite. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't there's, I think there's an article on the blog like, about going from maker to manager. Um, and I, I, spend, I spend a lot of my time, so okay, so there's certain types of um, the management side that, um, I do enjoy. So there's things like having one-on-ones with your team. I enjoy that because I, I enjoy the people that 
we've hired. I mean, they're just good people. It's fun having conversations about whatever. Um, and I certainly want to make sure they're happy because, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful that they're even like putting forth, you know, or dedicating the, their current career towards bare metrics. But, but past that, there's just lots of, uh, you know, like the, just the org organizational stuff, the like, um, all of the things that kind of come with making sure like you don't steer the ship into the ground. And, uh, and so a lot of times I find myself um, missing like the making part of things. So I actually, I, a year ago, hired um, an administrative assistant. And she's fantastic because she took a lot of that stuff off my plate mm -hmm. that, you know, which there's lots of different roles that can take a lot of stuff off your plate. Um, and, but I wish I had done that earlier. You know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to not have to do stuff not from like a laziness perspective, but from a, here are the things that I am not good at, and, there's, and it's a bad use of my time to try to become really good at it, because there's certain things that I think all of us have, um, we have a certain skill set, or at least talents, or we tend to be better at certain things than others, and so uh, trying to become amazing at something that's just not in your wheelhouse is a pretty bad use of your time, and so, there's a, people who are a lot better at, say, design than I am. So, I mean, I went to school for design, but I'm not a great designer. And so, as soon as I could hire a designer, it, well, yeah, it makes sense to do that, because I'm wasting my time trying to, like, make good design. Um, so, you know, I think uh, I, the, the more that you can sort of hire outside, get rid of the things that you don't want to do, like, that's an okay thing. I think from a CEO perspective, you think, like, uh, there are certain things that just come with the territory. Well, I mean, not necessarily, you know. Mm -hmm. If you don't like doing something, then there's probably somebody who does like doing it, and you should hire them, you know. So having a SaaS product that provides metrics for other SaaS companies, I'm sure you've come across a number of SaaS entrepreneurs over the years. What are some of the common challenges that you see them make, and what advice might you give them? Uh, so this is... Um, I, from a, coming from a metrics company, this may not make sense, but I think most people pay too much attention to metrics, um, mm -hmm. and I especially think early on, you should just wholesale ignore them. You know, mm -hmm. I think we'll have companies sign up who are like, you know, I'm not making any money yet. I'm like, well, what, what do you want me to tell? Like, <laughs> I, the whole thing is around revenue, and you have zero <laughs> of it. You know, like everything's going to be zeros. It's all bad. So, um, I. And, and, like they, and they gain no benefit from, so uh, you think of like churn, for instance, where it's a, basically the number of customers who are leaving um, in a given month. And, you know, somebody will be like, my churn rate's like 50%, which means they've just lost half their customers. And I'm like, how many customers do you have? Well, I've got four. And it, <laughs> like, we can't have a conversation here. There's nothing to talk about because you don't have the data, right? So, and that exists in any sort of um, metrics world. So A-B testing, for instance. People love to A-B test stuff. And, then, you know, you, you just don't have, there's not enough at the top of the funnel for it to matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, people love to get obsessed about numbers, though, because it's, because it's this very, tangible thing that you feel like you can hold on to and you can you feel like you can make decisions off of it because it's concrete and uh, and you can understand it like it feels like it gives you uh, an explanation for things um, but most of the time it's very misleading unless you just have enough of it and mm -hmm. so I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, mistakes that people make early on is paying too much attention to numbers that are really irre irrelevant and, um, and I think um, instead, there's early on this, this you kind of, you just need to go with your gut on a lot of things until, until there's enough data to, you know, backup some mm -hmm. of that stuff, but. Um, so there's lots of talk about being a data-driven entrepreneur sure. and a data-driven CEO right. or executive or yes. whatnot, but the reality is in the startup phase, especially pre-product market fit, right. there's no good you data to, right. to look at. Exactly. You just don't have, there's just not enough of it, so. You know, I, I, but again, people get obsessed about it and will really freak out. And there's, there's not any reason to. Like, just go, like, I think it's uh, important to have a, a goal or something to work towards. Um, but early on, a lot of, like, what you should be working towards, the only number you should be, like, trying to increase is how much money you're making. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, until you're at X dollars in revenue, all the other things that come along with it don't matter. And you should just focus on, you know, you think of it like a, you're in a hole and like, you're trying to dig yourself out. I mean, you need a, you need a bigger shovel 
Whereas like trying to figure out how to tweak user churn or lifetime value or whatever else is like you've got this like little garden trowel and like you need a backhoe. <laughs> and, uh, and I think people get obsessed with the tiny things when they don't matter. So once the company was able to pay yourself a salary, you felt like you're on the right path. Were there mm -hmm. other milestones or other you know, points of information that you're like, man, this, this bare metrics thing's actually gonna work. It's gonna be a, yeah. a real business. So I think, I, in hindsight, I would not look at it this way, but at the time I did. So um, shortly after, well, almost a year in, um, I, especially after we made our numbers public and things were going really well from like a growth rate perspective, mm -hmm. um, so you start getting all these investor calls and people wanting to put money into it. And I had no interest. I so bootstrapped the whole thing, um, and then uh, ended up being. I got approached with some really good terms, so we ended up raising eight hundred thousand dollars at a ten million dollar valuation. And so from a the economics of that, it's like, well, sure, it's a mm -hmm. great terms. Like, why not? Mm -hmm. I it, whatever I. You know, I'm indifferent. That's essentially eight percent of the company, sort of dumbing it down a little bit. But um, I didn't care to keep if I kept 100 percent or not. So fine, eight percent of the company. I get eight hundred thousand dollars. I can hire, and everybody's happy. We make billions of dollars. Um, so that felt like a validator for me. Mm -hmm. was, was looking at the bank account and there being a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I think I, then I quickly figured out that that's not the case and you spend the money that you're given. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and so this is, yeah, so I ended up spending all the money and almost ran out of it. And so like a reality check came real quick mm -hmm. after, after we raised the money. But like I think a lot of times people look at and we celebrate as, a, as an industry mm -hmm. someone raising money, which is a little weird. But I, that's what people end up doing, right? And you talk about, hey, we got $20 million. Or even if it's just like a small, we got $50,000 or whatever. It's like, yay, congrats, but a lot, a lot of levels, it's, uh, I think it ends up making things worse mentally for a lot of people. Mm. So, um, so the investors approached you. Yes. The Im investors gave you a term sheet that you accepted, so Correct. it must have been at or better than your desired expectations from an investment point of view. Yeah. Any other sort of terms or timelines that they say, hey, Josh, you know, we're going to invest and we want to make... XR dollars back in the five years? Yeah. Any expectations? Um, so we had no, we had a very weird deal. So um, I mentioned Stripe, who's the payment processor. Um, so they were trying to sort of kickstart this fund for people building stuff on their platform. So they were the ones who initially approached. They set the valuation, all that. I mean, I, I think we start to finish, I had to do no negotiating, they threw out the $10 million valuation. I said, yeah, that sounds great. Like, mm -hmm. no, we're making like $10,000 right now. Who cares? Like, yeah, 10 million sounds great. What, um, what was the approximate run rate at that time? I mean, I really, so I think, um, let's see, that was, it was probably 10 to $15,000. Of ARR. Oh, no, no, that was MRR. MRR, so, so like 120 grand. 100,000, 100, but we'll say 100,000. 100 grand. Um, so they gave you a West Coast valuation even though you were in I'm Alabama. I'm in Alabama. Yeah, right, you know. so they gave you a California valuation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, here. sounds good. Though, in hindsight, uh, so, okay, so they started, uh, I'm oversimplifying a little bit. They started with $500,000. I, I later had to raise an additional $300,000 because mm. I spent the five hundred. dollars mm. and, uh, and, and at that point when I had to go and like add on, it was like a, a bridge round essentially, same terms, just sort of extended it a little bit. And I realized at that point that the valuation actually came back to kick, like, it kicked my butt because, um, by the time we were in a, bat, in a not as great spot um, on the growth side of things, it became very difficult to try to raise an additional amount of money to just keep mm -hmm. us from going out of business. Mm -hmm. And so it's like at a $10 million valuation, like, but you're now like your growth rate is no longer 30% month over month. Mm -hmm. It becomes a lot more difficult. And I still didn't, I didn't care about the valuation anyways. It's like I wished almost that I had taken a lower valuation if I had known that I was going to have to try to get some more money later mm -hmm. on. Um, and so a lot of entrepreneurs glorify the fundraising process yeah, yeah. and celebrate it as a, right. a big milestone. And, and for you and your type of business, it was actually something that, you know, is more challenging and had more difficult, yeah. you know. I think, well, so I think the, the biggest lesson learned from that was 
um, what to use the money for. Mm -hmm. So um, I forget who it was. I think it was maybe like uh, Justin Khan from ultimately from Twitch, um, mm -hmm. who was saying like any money doesn't matter how much money you raise, you will spend it all in 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. In which I I found that to be the case. And so it doesn't matter if you raised 100,000 or 100 million, the, the thing is that like, it burns a hole in your pocket and you start mm -hmm. thinking, well, of course, any problem can be solved by throwing money at it and then your growth will match that somehow. I don't know where we get that idea from, but somehow that's the thinking is if we hire a ton of people, those people will somehow bring with them millions of dollars or something. I don't know, mm -hmm. but um, but op op entrepreneurs are optimistic, right? And you I know, mean, you see exactly. lots of shiny objects. Sure, you want to go chase the What's next that? growth trigger right. in the business, and you keep and you keep you keep doing that, and you keep thinking that if I fuel the fire with some more money on hiring, mm -hmm. that that's the that's the way that you measure. Um, I think a lot of times startups measure success by headcount um, versus, say, profit, right. uh, especially in the VC fund, heavily VC-funded world. Um, and so you think, you know, I mean, there are a lot of startups who will have hiring-specific goals where, like, we need to hire 10 people a month, or, you know, we need, by the end of the year, we we'll, we'll need to have hired 1,000 new people. And... Uh, and that's that works for big companies, but like when you're one or two people, you're not a big company, and there's no it's you shouldn't operate and optimize the same way that they are, and um, so what I ended up I think my, my back to my biggest lesson was that I shouldn't have spent or that spending money on hiring is really risky because it's it's a it's a knob that you can't adjust very easily. It's not like a marketing spend where okay the, our burn rate's way too high we, we need to lower the we need to lower our marketing spend. Well, no, you can't just stop paying people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's very difficult to course correct when all of your um, expenses are tied up in, in headcount. So that was, that was sort of a big mistake there. I'm not opposed to the money side. I like money. I, I think it's, um, it's just what I spend it on, I think, spend, spending too fast on hiring. So, so does, does bare metrics scratch your maker itch, or do you have any, any side hustles going on right now that you'd like to share? Yeah, well, um, so I, I, I very much is my full-time thing, but I, um, I have to not stare at a computer. Um, that's, so I spend a decent amount of time doing, uh, I actually make a lot of stuff out of concrete and wood. So um, that's very specifically an analog thing, for, uh, project for me, uh, intentionally. Um, because I need to give my brain a break from focusing on bare metrics. And I think um, a lot of times, especially founders, um, whether they're CEO or just co-founder in some other role, end up attaching their identity to their company. And so it's a, this emotional roller coaster if you do that, because companies are up and down. They're not mm -hmm. you know, just straight to the top. And so when you attach your own identity to that, it becomes an extremely stressful situation. And so when you can detach it and find enjoyment in other things and let your brain chew on other problems, that's mm -hmm. really beneficial. So yeah, I've got a number of side projects just for, to give my brain a break from thinking about metrics. Yeah. So you meet a, an entrepreneur on the street, the entrepreneur says, hey Josh, I wanna be a SaaS entrepreneur. Yes. What piece of advice or two would you offer up to him? Mm. So it depends on their skill set. I think mm -hmm. the first is to have a skill set that involves um, really probably development more than anything. So um, the ability to have an idea, to make the idea on some level, and then see if there's anything there is extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I see happen a lot of times is someone has an idea, no ability to execute on it, so they end up having to go, you know, they'll contract out something to mm -hmm. have somebody build something for them. Um, they'll spend a lot of their savings on that. I mean, a lot, you know, I've seen people spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of their own savings to have somebody build out a thing for them, all based on the, uh, the singular idea that they believe will work, and in reality, it didn't. It was mm -hmm. a just flawed idea for whatever reason. And, uh, and so then they find themselves out of a couple hundred thousand dollars. When, if they had spent a month or two 
learning some basic programming, mm -hmm. they could have built something to prove if the idea had legs or not, mm -hmm. and then found out it didn't and moved on to something else. And um, you know, I uh, I think the probably biggest bit of advice is you know your idea isn't really worth anything, and um, you'll have lots of ideas. And the, the, more, the sooner or the faster that you can figure out if an idea works or not. And this is from whether you're building, like want to start a new company, or you have an idea for something within the company you're already running, mm -hmm. is the ability to um, prove an idea faster than you know, having to wait for some development team to build something for you is extremely valuable long term. Mm -hmm. So um, even if you already have a company and you just have some ideas about what we could add on to the company or whatever, Having some baseline sort of programming skills, I think, is immensely valuable. So, bare metrics over a million dollars yeah. of recurring revenue, yep. a handful of employees. Mm -hmm. What's the current challenge? What's your your main next rock you want to move in the business? Yeah. So, I figured out I don't like sales and marketing um, <laughs> at all, and I think well, part of that time. So, all that out. awesome stuff we heard from Brad just About, went in one side and out the other, and yeah. You're just, all, so I mean, we do we have this backlog of I've written I don't know maybe a couple hundred articles that really actually do really well uh, and I don't want to do it anymore so um, I biggest challenge right now is figuring out we've put all our eggs in the content marketing basket mm -hmm. and because that was just a natural outpouring of my ability that just happened to be there so uh, I talked earlier about how um, I think it's important to hire for the thing, like, instead of trying to get good at something that you just don't necessarily have the skill set for, um, you should hire it out. And that's the case for me with marketing. It's like I was good at the content side of things, but I'm not a good marketer. Mm -hmm. um, so I could, I could spend months trying to become a good marketer, and I hate every second of it. Um, or I can just hire someone to spend their time and energy focusing on that so that I can think more about like the product stuff, which is where I really enjoy. So uh, biggest thing right now is finding somebody who does love the sales and marketing side of just like the growth side of building a company. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. So with the Bear Metrics software, I'm sure you get to see metrics from a lot of other companies. Any company, without saying the company name, but industry, you're like, man, I can't believe they make so much money. Um, yes. Yeah, so the... Um, Affiliate marketers. Yeah, there's some. Man, those guys. There's some pyramid schemes out there that just. They're doing real good. Wow. So good. Lots. Yes. I, so like some of our biggest customers, we're talking tens of millions of dollars a month. A month. Uh, are in that industry. So wow. They're. I mean, extremely volatile. Yeah. You know. But so Google could slash your rankings tomorrow, and, and they will be out of business. And they'll be out of business. Absolutely. But seen right that, now, seen they're that just, multiple times. They're ringing the cash register right, right now. So. Uh, I don't recommend going into that. It's again, it's very volatile. Yeah. Um, and it, subscription box companies, so like mm -hmm. um, loot crate and those those kind of things, right? So those are huge. Their margins are minuscule. Mm -hmm. um, so from an actual profit perspective, they're not doing that great. But they make millions of dollars a month in revenue from subscription mm -hmm. beard oil. I mean, subscription beard oil. Yeah, that's the thing. Wow. Right. So um, yeah, those are those are some interesting ones too. Yeah. Which we've published, so uh, talking about like how other companies are doing. We actually have a benchmarks thing where you can go, I think it's barometrics.com slash benchmarks. That sounds like it would be the thing. Um, <laughs> something about, just look for like open benchmarks. Um, where you can see like how a, we've, we've uh, made the benchmarks of SaaS companies at different um, price points. Like, so if you, your average revenue per user is 100 bucks, here's what the MRR, mm -hmm. lifetime value, churn, growth rates, all that stuff are for companies in that cohort. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of play the like, well, how's, how do other people at similar stages as us, how are they doing? Like that kind of thing. So if you're interested in that. Awesome. Yeah. Let's open it up for questions in the audience here. And so while the microphones are being retrieved, what's the you know, one thing, if you could wave a magic wand and change about bare metrics, what would you change about the business? Um, our reliance on, um, so, sort of obscure thing, but a reliance on third party data. So, mm -hmm. reliance on, so there's also Stripe lots of work, and Recurly and those Stripe, guys, or, yeah, us, some, the data existing somewhere else and mm -hmm. us having to bring it in, it's mm -hmm. a nightmare. 
So, uh, so constantly syncing data and correct. That's really difficult. API from, uh, calls or the streaming API stuff or... and like staying on top of just people do really dumb stuff with their data. So we have to deal with that and all mm -hmm. the infinite number of edge cases. So I would not have done it at all. <laughs> I mean, like from the perspective of how, if I knew how difficult it was to actually do all that stuff, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have started. Not that I don't regret it, but it's like a you know if you know how hard something will be, it usually will convince you to not do it. Mm -hmm. And that certainly would have been the case here if I had known. So being blissfully ignorant going into it was a pro. Was probably sense. a good thing at the time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Awesome, questions? Hey, thank you so much for your presentation. Very valuable. Um, my question is very quick. Uh, you mentioned that you're uh, you know, looking for marketing, you know, hiring and marketing. What are some things that you're looking for as far as like, you know, if you were gonna hire a marketing person to your company, or what is a good reason why you wouldn't hire a marketing agency as well, or you know, a contractor, a third party, or some something of that sort? Yeah, Thank you so, so great, much. Great question there, especially on the uh, basically outsourcing it versus bringing it in house. So um, I think we have dabbled in the outsourcing that stuff a little bit. Didn't love the results, and I think so much of it is that I think whenever you there's a clear path to put a dollar in, get $5 back. Um, if you can find someone who can then like, execute on that, so you think of paid uh, like, like PPC stuff, or uh, I, when, you, when you can do that and have somebody who just needs to execute on that, that can be a great thing to outsource. I think for us, we're in this transition phase where we've done a thing one way for a long time, and now we need to figure out what's, what are the other ways we should be exploring things. Um, it's, it's much more cost efficient to have that in-house where you've got a person who loves, who is a generalist, just like most people at our company are, who can try lots of things and isn't so focused on, well, we do this thing and we do a lot of that, instead it's somebody who can just explore and try a dozen different channels and figure out, figure out what we need to be doing next and then can execute on that and maybe we, you can then even outsource the execution of that after the fact, but I want somebody who, knows the company and uh, and is able to really sort of dig in there and not feel this like, ah, oh, we're just paying money for an agency and they, nobody really knows what we're doing. We're gonna have somebody in the house for that. So. Hey, I, I think you had said you're, I think David said you're around a million ARR, yeah. a little over that, and you have seven or eight employees. Uh -huh. Do you mind going through all the employees just in terms of kind of roles and org yep. structure? Sure, so we have um, three engineers, uh, a designer, uh, customer support, uh, I have an administrative assistant. Um, what am I missing here? You're on the spot, on video, so oh, God. your direct report is gonna ask you why you forgot about them. Me? <laughs> I'm on there? Are you the only developer? I'm no, developer. I have three developers. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I've mentioned the assistant. Holy moly. We'll edit out this segment of the video. Right, right, right. Um, uh, Customer success, marketing. No sales. I did fire somebody recently. Jeez. I think that's, that's seven. Maybe it was yeah, seven. Yeah, that's seven. Do you write any code yourself Jeez. anymore? Uh, no. no. I, I was, those privileges were removed. Mm. Mm -hmm. You saw the light. They I, saw the light. I mean, I kept breaking stuff, so. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, they said, no more, Josh. No, no more. more. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I really appreciate your honesty. You didn't have to. Um, two quick questions. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, with regards to starting 50 businesses and uh, in the early uh, 2000s. Yeah. Uh, could you just for a brief moment go into like, to provide some context for some of the younger people, like what exactly did you, were you certain of was gonna be a fantastic idea, but then didn't turn out to be well, you know? Every one of them, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then a little bit to the, the second question has to do with uh, capital allocation with uh -huh. the money and yep. startups. It was a really astute observation. I have a couple of friends that have gone out to the Bay and they've done internships and stuff. And uh, do you think it's like a substitution for not like more critical thinking? Because uh, everyone says kind of like the same thing. They've observed that there's not a lot of fidelity. They're hiring people, but they're not completely sure. And I, I think they're hoping that they're going to get some of that from the new hires. 
or uh, also like they get a lot of pushing from I think the VCs to to hire hit milestones. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely the case. I, mean, I had a, so one of um, one of my early hires actually. Uh, so he'd worked remotely um, for us for years, uh, and then had decided he like missed working um, having coworkers. He'd, his cat was not enough, so um, he decided to to find and go work for a company. This is in Vancouver, and the company he went and worked for. He then ended up quitting a couple months later because he found himself always in meetings about hiring. Like it was all they were doing was just hiring. They had not, they had not mm -hmm. launched a product. Um, they were just constantly talking about organizational structuring and like here's how we do you know HR stuff and like everybody's just talking about hiring and growing these different teams within the company but nobody's making anything and um, that's not all again that's not always the case but um, I think the you know as far as going to the Bay Area to work or whatever I think the biggest benefit you'll find is just starting something yourself and and Statistically, fail it. I mean, you're going to fail at it. But I think too many people hate failing. Or again, this kind of goes back to the programming thing I mentioned earlier, where it's not. It wasn't expensive for me to try all those ideas. It cost me nothing, except my time and then you know my ego. Whether it was months later realizing it was the dumbest idea I've ever had, and um, I think you you'll learn more than any whether you go intern at a startup, whether you go get uh, you know, an MBA, I, you'll learn so much more in three months of trying to make something exist out of nothing uh, than anything else, really. So. Hi. You mentioned that, I'm over here. <laughs> you mentioned that um, you had a difficult time initially hiring people. Um, did you, I mean, can you give us an idea of sort of how many people you initially talked to, what the level of frequency that you were talking to people and trying to hire those early engineers? Uh, and, and how are you able to sort of make that, okay, I'm gonna hire someone from Europe? Right, so, um, so we don't necessarily have a hard time hiring. Um, and early on it was more of byproduct of, of me um, trying to do too much myself, like not thinking I needed someone. I think, um, I had, I think the hardest thing early on is trying, when, especially when it comes to engineers, is you're competing with engineer salaries that, you think in like San Francisco, can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, it's insane, right? They're like, hey, I want a $300,000 salary, and you're like an entry level engineer. No, thank you. So um, I think that's one of the massive benefits of the remote side. It's not the, um, when hiring remotely, I don't hire remotely so that I can pay somebody less. It's that it removes, it normalizes s salaries to something that's, you know, you think in the Bay Area, they're, they're incredibly inflated over, um, only because of supply and demand, right? Like there's just a massive demand, they can't hire fast enough, but we don't have to deal with that. So I hired people who, my the engineer that I hired first, he was, at the time, traveling around the country on a bus with his family. Like, who cares what he, like, I don't care where he is. He didn't care where he was. Where, where, he, you know. So I met him at a, a networking thing, yeah. So that's really been the case for almost any hire. It's, uh, it's that they have a specific sort of lifestyle, not in the lifestyle business perspective, but from a, you know, they like where they live. They, maybe they have a family and they don't want to have, they don't want to move to a big city or anything, and they just like where they live. So sure, we'll hire there. Uh, so uh, I, I've obviously read a good bit of your content and, and, and things like that. So when when you when you create a bunch of content, you uh, seem to dog food your content with your app, right? Uh, and how how much in the product development life cycle, how much in the um, marketing life cycle has just dog fooding your own app benefited from? from those things, right? Like so, so using those as funnels for feature development, things like that. How, how is the content marketing? Well, no, how, how is the actual, um, the, the actual data flowing through your app been able to generate those, those dog food funnels and then um, actually generated new features out of those things uh, from the feedback loops that, that, uh, that other people give to you through that content? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think, 
Um, I, it's just sort of, I, uh, I, I read all that stuff. A lot of our team reads the feedback that comes in from that stuff, and you know, if it makes sense to put it into a feature, great. And I, I think, and then certainly we use you know the data that we see in our own product to create new things. I mean, I, so from a marketing perspective, um, like we had done this benchmarking thing where people were always asking, like, how am I doing? I mean, I was having those phone calls every week of somebody saying, like, I don't know how I'm doing. And of course, we've got our demo that's like showing one company's how they're doing. So then I was like, well, what if we offered some sort of benchmark thing so that we make this open benchmark page anybody can see? And then we eventually built that into the app itself um, so that anybody can compare their numbers to the, their sort of spot in the industry. And um, I think all that, com it's very sort of organic of let's try something. It's not, it may or may not work, but if it does, cool. If it doesn't, fine, whatever, that's fine too. Yep. Sure. Make their stuff public? Yeah, well, so we've got dozens of companies that do it now. I mean, I, um, that was, you, have, you take companies who are already being transparent. So a company like Buffer is insanely transparent, right? They're making each individual salary public, right? Like, that's about as transparent as it gets. And so we just, in that particular case was perfect timing of, hey, you guys already make stuff public, let's facilitate that, and then we get lots of free marketing, so. Mm -hmm.